light of the government's decision to prorogue the parliament uh, next week, it has become an urgent matter for parliament to discuss, in particular for this house to discuss, whether it can accept a no-deal exit. And I therefore am asking you to grant an urgent debate understanding Order 24 about that matter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm very grateful to the right honourable gentleman for his application, which is not entirely a matter of surprise either to members of the House or to large numbers of people outside it. I have heard what he said, I am familiar with his rationale, and I am satisfied that the matter is proper to be discussed under the terms of Standing Order No. 24. Does the Right Honourable Gentleman have the leave of the House? The Right Honourable Gentleman clearly enjoys the support of the House. I will go further. I will be my normal generous self to the Honourable Gentleman the Member for Wellingborough in advertising for those who didn't hear it that the Honourable Gentleman was robustly objecting, which he is absolutely entitled to do. So people need be in no doubt that there was an objection. In those circumstances, it is necessary for at least 40 members to rise in their places to support the application. There is a very much larger number than 40 members rising in support. So the Right Honourable Gentleman has obtained the leave of the House. The debate will be held today as the first item of public business. It will last for up to three hours. And that is to say, if it starts before seven o'clock, and it will arise on a motion that the House has considered the specified matter set out in the application by the Right Honourable Gentleman. We now come to the ten-minute rule motion. Oh, well, the Honourable Gentleman is... I wouldn't even say chuntering. He's gesticulating in a mildly eccentric manner from a sedentary position. But I'm all agog to learn more of what he wishes to raise in his point of order. Point of order, Mr Peter Bow. Thank you, sir. It was really a, a just a procedural point, and I would draw your attention to page 33 of Standing, Orders, uh, Standing Order 24. When a Standing Order is notified on a Tuesday, it has to be by 10.30 in the morning. I inquired in the vote office after 10.30 this morning and was told that no Standing Order 24 application had yet been made, though they were expecting it. So it seems to me, sir, that under those circumstances it could not be heard today and it should have been heard tomorrow. And that was why I was trying to make the point so early on, so we couldn't go through it. And that seems very clear. Well, uh, I understand the rationale of the Honourable Gentleman, and I thank him for explaining his agitation to raise his point at an early stage. However, I must advise the Honourable Gentleman that the responsibility of a member seeking to make such an application, I must admit I thought he would have known this because he's a keen partisan of parliamentary opportunities for backbenchers. The responsibility of a member seeking to make such an application is to lodge that application with the Speaker. And I can advise the Honourable Gentleman that that application was lodged with me and my office yesterday evening. So it was well in time. Moreover, I hope I carry the House with me in observing that whatever people think of the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Dorset West, his courtesy is unsurpassed by any other member of this House. And it was partly on account of that courtesy and because he wanted his intentions to be entirely intelligible that he was keen that his motion, if judged orderly, should be published as early as possible. And it was published some hours ago. So the Honourable Gentleman has had a good try, but I think that his efforts on this occasion, on that point, have been exhausted. And I would suggest that the courteous thing now to do would be to proceed with the 10-minute 
rule motion for which the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Croydon South, has been patiently waiting. Ten minute rule motion. Chris Phil. Mr Speaker, I beg to move that leave be given to bring in a clean air bill to make provision about mitigating air pollution, including through the use of low emission zones, prohibiting vehicle idling, restricting the sale of certain engine types, require local authorities to undertake tree planting and take steps to promote electric propulsion systems in buses and taxis. Order. This is most unfair on the Honourable Gentleman who is raising an important matter. May I please appeal to Honourable and Right Honourable Members who are not as keenly attentive to the contents of the Gentleman Rule Motion as I would like to be to continue their conversations outside of the Chamber. It is only fair that the Honourable Gentleman who has booked his slot should be heard in speaking up for his cause and his constituents. Mr Chris Phil. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm uh, delighted to see so many colleagues attending this uh, ten-minute rule motion this afternoon. I I knew that clean air was a topic which would command such widespread interest across the House. The story of Ella Kissy Deborah is a tragic one. Ella lived near Lewisham, just 80 feet from the North Circular, one of South London's most congested highways. As a South London MP, I can testify to the notorious congestion and pollution on that road. Ella tragically died of asthma and acute respiratory failure in 2013 after experiencing three years of seizures. Her mother, Rosmond, believes that pollution caused her daughter's death. Earlier this year, the Attorney General and the High Court gave permission for a new inquest to formally investigate the link between pollution and Ella's death. Of course, we cannot generalise from one case, but the evidence suggests that Ella's mum is right about the serious health risks of air pollution and especially nitrous oxides and particulate matter. In 2016, a report by the Royal College of Physicians found that air pollution cut short an estimated 40,000 lives a year in the UK. The young, the old and those with medical conditions are most at risk. Evidence to a Joint Select Committee in 2018 said that air pollution is the second largest cause, avoidable cause of death after smoking. The committee also found that health impacts ranged from causing premature births to respiratory and heart disease to dementia. My own twins were born very prematurely at 25 weeks, and reading that Select Committee report, I wondered if air pollution in London contributed to their extreme prematurity. The Joint Select Committee's report findings are corroborated by academic studies, including published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, much progress has been made since 1970, nitrous oxide and particulate pollution has reduced by around about 70 per cent. But the truth is, we we must do much, much more. And the Government's clean air strategy, published in January of this year, recognises that. And in particular, it recognises the importance of the World Health Organisation limit of 10 micrograms per cubic metre for PM2.5 particulates, much lower than the EU limit of 25. But it is an inescapable fact that pollution levels in the UK are too high. As a South London MP, I see that in my own constituency. The A23 running through Croydon, which includes the Purley Way, is much too polluted. And I'm sure many colleagues around the House, particularly from urban areas, have similar problems in their own constituencies. Now, the Government's clean air strategy has many commendable ideas to address this, including action to fund electric vehicle charging rollout I see the Minister of State for Transport is in his place and proposed measures to prohibit polluting the most polluting wood burning stoves. But the clean air strategy needs to be put on a statutory footing and this Parliament needs to follow previous parliaments in passing a Clean Air Act as we did in 1956, 1968 and 1993 to great effect. 
And we need to go much further, I think, than the measures proposed in the clean air strategy. For example, we should be looking at vehicle idling, where cars are left while stationary with their engines running. The sight of cars parked with their engine running outside schools yeah. is a sight that every parent, including me, finds very worrying. Efforts to stop this on a voluntary basis have not worked, and therefore fines similar to parking tickets, I think, will be more effective at stopping this behaviour. Uh, trees, Mr Speaker, absorb huge amounts of pollution, so planting more trees in urban areas will help. Specifically, moss walls have been found to be particularly effective at absorbing airborne heavy metals, and each section absorbs uh, emissions equivalent to 42 diesel cars per month. And speaking of diesel cars, diesel cars play an especially damaging role in air pollution. Governments of both colours and the European Union have encouraged diesel cars over the last 20 uh, or 30 years because of their lower CO2 emissions, but they emit far more particulate and nitrous oxide emissions, which hugely damage air quality on the streets where those cars are driven. And it's worrying that diesel car use consequently, or diesel car sales, have consequently gone up from 18% of new car sales in 2001 to a peak of 50% in 2015. And this is especially problematic because the real world emissions of diesel cars are six times higher than the uh, emissions made in laboratory conditions. And the Volkswagen scandal, I think, underscored the problems where they intentionally cheated the emissions testing regime. It's vital we hold manufacturers like Volkswagen to account for their damage they've done to our, to our clean air. And buses and taxis should be a particular focus because, of course, they're regulated often by local authorities or operated by local authorities. In London, only 155 buses out of 9,000 are fully electric. Whereas, by contrast, in China, in the city of Shenzhen, every single one of their 16,000 buses is electric. And even Santiago in Chile has over twice the number of electric buses that London does. So I'd like to see all of our buses and taxis be electrically operated. If we do that, it will cut London's transport emissions by 20 per cent. There is a great deal more that a Clean Air Act could do. I think it is of vital importance to our nation's health that we do have a Clean Air Act. And uh, if, by some uh, great misfortune, in the three or four days between now and prorogation, um, this private member's bill does not somehow reach the statute books, no, no. I, uh, I, extraordinary though it sounds, I very much hope that in a future Queen's speech, a Clean Air Act does feature. Mr Speaker, there are many issues that divide this House. In the coming hours and days, I expect we will hear a great deal of discord and disagreement, uh, in which I may well myself participate. But now, on this issue of clean air, I hope this House may speak as one. I commend this bill to the House. Order. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many as other say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? James Gray, Gillian Keegan, Marilla Mia, Marilla, Maria Miller, <laughs> Sir Henry Bellingham, Sarah Newton, Harriet Harman, Ellie Reeves, Steve Reed, Sir Edward Davy, Douglas Chapman, and Jim Shannon. <laughs> oh, and, uh, and myself, sir. Aye. Thank you. Chris Phillips. Yeah. <laughs> Clean air number two bill. Second reading what day? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Thank you. Would, uh, we now come to the motion in the name of Sir Oliver Letwin and others to be moved under standing order number 24. I remind the House, and it is a case of reminding, as reference was made to this matter only a few moments ago, that a paper with the terms of the motion has been distributed. To move the motion, I call Sir Oliver Letwin. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
Mr. Speaker, I rise to move the motion under Standing Order 24 that is in my name and in the name of many honourable and right honourable members across the House. This motion, Mr. Speaker, arises because of four facts. The first fact is that over the last six weeks, the Government has not produced a single indication of any viable proposal to replace the backstop by any alternative likely to prove acceptable to the EU. The likelihood of the Government reaching a deal at the Council meeting on the 17th and 18th of October on the terms that the Government itself has set is accordingly slight. The second fact is that this is the last week in which Parliament will have the ability to block a no-deal exit on the 31st of October. Because the Government is proroguing us until the 14th of October, and the Government has made clear that it will fight in the courts any legislation proposed and passed to mandate an extension of the Article 50 process. There will not be time after the 14th of October for Parliament both to legislate and for that legislation to be enforced on a reluctant Government through the courts. The third fact is that in the absence of a deal with the EU on the terms that the Government itself has set, and in the absence of an order from the Supreme Court that the Government should apply to extend our, the Article 50 period, the Government will lead our country into a no-deal exit on the 31st of October. This has been made clear by the Prime Minister on repeated occasions. And the fourth and final fact is that so far from constituting a threat to the EU that will force them to capitulate and remove the backstop, the Government's intention or willingness to lead the country into a no-deal exit is a threat to our country. The Prime Minister is much in the position of someone standing on one side of a canyon, shouting to people on the other side of the canyon that if they do not do as he wishes, he will throw himself into the abyss. <laughs> that is not a credible negotiating strategy. And it is, I will in a moment, and it is also not a responsible strategy, given that the rest of us are to be dragged over the edge with the Prime Minister. I give way to my own. I thank my right honourable friend. I thank my right honourable friend for giving way. Most of us in this place would prefer a good deal, trade deal, to no deal. But does he not understand that in any negotiation, the chances of a bad deal materially increase if you signal to the other side that you're not prepared to walk away? Does he not see that? Well, these, are, these are difficult matters of judgment, and I respect the judgment that my honourable friend makes, but it's different from mine. When we were negotiating the coalition between the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats, which gave rise to a rather good government, we were sitting around wondering how to conduct those negotiations, and we came to the conclusion that actually we should disobey the rules of negotiation that he's describing and offer a bold and imaginative offer to the other side, which was then accepted, and we formed a coalition on the terms we wished to form it on by mutual accord. And then they got wiped that out. is the way in which, I believe, these negotiations can proceed. Can to offer a threat which actually harms us many times more than those against whom the threat is supposedly levelled is not, as I say, a credible negotiating strategy, in my view. I, I accept that our judgments differ on this, but that is my judgment. It is a matter for the House to decide which of the two judgments is correct. I will, though, may I just say before I give way to my hon. Friend that this is the last intervention I will take before I move on a bit. It goes straight to this point. And, uh, if he recalls the Foreign Affairs Committee report on No Deal two weeks before uh, we gave uh, notice under Article 50, which was unanimously agreed across the Committee, wholly split uh, on the merits of the issue, it concluded that the damage that would be done by a failure to uh, get an agreement between the United Kingdom and the European Union would, in material terms, be greater for the European Union, but in proportionate terms, greater for the United Kingdom. But the absolute damage being represented on the other side um, is, is at stake, and so his negotiation point. Uh, it's very, very selfish, but if, if this intervention is so long as to stop other people, Sir Oliver Letwin. Well, I, I agree with my honourable friend that the proportions are different from the absolutes, 
but I fear that my honourable friend's uh, committee's report was deficient, in my view, in an important respect. There is a counterbalancing point from the EU's perspective, and that is that actually demonstrating that it causes great pain proportionately to the country that's doing it is regarded as a significant political and ideological and geopolitical advantage. We have no similar advantage in this. So the threat to our prosperity and the welfare of our people is the only issue which arises, whereas for them there is a positive advantage in a no-deal exit to be balanced against the absolute and proportionately much smaller effect on their economies. Again, my honourable friend and I may differ in this judgment. That is the judgment we are asking the House to make. I take the view I have espoused. Mr Speaker, in the light of these four facts, the slender chance of a deal being struck on the Government's terms, the fact that this is Parliament's last chance to block a no-deal exit on the 31st of October, the fact that without a parliamentary block the Government is willing to take us into a no-deal, and the fact that the prospect of such a disorderly and undemocratic no-deal exit is a threat to our prosperity and our union, rather than an effective negotiating strategy, in my view, with the EU, in the light of these four facts, we are putting forward to the House today a motion, the sole purpose of which is to enable the House tomorrow to debate and vote on a bill in the names of the Right Honourable Member for Leeds Central and my Right Honourable Friend, the Member for North East not Bedfordshire. Me. Not me. <laughs> not me. <laughs> if the House votes for this motion tonight, it will give itself the ability to vote for that bill tomorrow. And that bill will mandate the Prime Minister to seek an extension to the 31st of January unless he's either got a deal in place at the end of the European Council meeting in October and has got it agreed, I will in a moment, and has got it agreed by Parliament, or has got Parliament to agree to a no-deal exit by the 19th of October. Thank you, thank my honourable friend for giving I thank my honourable friend for giving way. He said in his speech just now that he thinks there is a sl only a very slender chance of a deal. I disagree with him on that point, but also that he wishes to block no deal. If he sees no chance, a little of no chance of a deal, and little or no chance of no deal, what is the point of an extension to the 31st of January if it's not just to do it again, this again and again and again? And can he not see the damage that it would do to businesses to have this process repeated for three, every three months infinitum? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uncertainty does create difficulty for business. A no-deal exit will create a great deal more difficulty for business, in my judgment. The purpose of the extension, which will no doubt be debated extensively tomorrow if this motion is passed and there is a debate about the bill tomorrow, is very clear. It is to provide the Government with the time to seek to solve this problem and to enable Parliament to help, I am afraid I won't give way again, uh, help to resolve an issue which has proved very difficult. I don't say it's easy to do by the 31st of January, but I am sure that it will not be done by the 31st of October. We are between a rock and a hard place, and in this instance, the hard place is better than the rock. It is as simple as that. It's decision time. If honourable members across the House want to prevent a no-deal exit on the 31st of October, they will have the opportunity to do so if, but only if, they vote for this motion this evening. I hope they will do so. Yeah. Order. The question is the motion as on the order paper, as on the paper distributed. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to support the motion in the name of the Honourable Member for West Dorset. During my time in this House, every Prime Minister has accepted there can be honourable disagreements. And I've had many disagreements with each and every one of them. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> that has led to many votes in this House which haven't always been entered into with the certainty of the outcome or a victory. But both sides have always done so, safe in the knowledge that this Parliament is sovereign, that this Parliament can act as an effective block on any abuse of power. Therefore, today, I am urging all MPs from all sides to stand up for what is right, to stand up for what you believe in, and support this cross-party move. Would my right honourable friend give way? Yes. 
I thank, you, I thank my right honourable friend. Does my right honourable friend agree that if we are to trust the Prime Minister that a deal is in sight, he would do all he could to show evidence of the progress he has made in negotiations over the summer and publish the government's proposals? I think my friend makes a very pertinent point there because in the six weeks or so since the Prime Minister took office, Apparently, no proposals have been put to the European Union. There has been no substantive negotiations. And he keeps talking about the prospects of progress being made. Well, one would have thought he'd have something practical to report to this House by this stage. And so far, there has not been any. Yes, to give way to the Honourable Member. If a motion comes forward in the next fall in the week for a general election in October, will he vote for it, yes or no? We are ready for a general election. We are ready to take on this government and ready to win a general election to end austerity and poverty across this country. But, Mr Speaker, just look, Mr. Speaker, just look at what we face. A government determined, determined to subvert the democratic process, to force through a policy which a majority of this House does not support, which has been defeated emphatically twice in this House. We face a government so determined to continue on its reckless path. They are willing to use every trick in the book and find every loophole to try and silence this House. We cannot, we cannot stand idly by. To the Leader of the Opposition. In 2015, I think I'm correct in saying that the Leader of the Opposition voted for the referendum. Did he mean to abide by what the referendum came forward with? Yes, the Labour opposition did support the referendum. We did take part in the referendum campaign. We also made it very clear in the general election that we would not countenance a no-deal exit from the European Union because of the damage it would do. And so we cannot hope for another opportunity further down the line to stop this government's destructive course. There is no more time. They've taken it away. This may be our last opportunity. Today, Mr Speaker, we must act. Thank my right hon. Friend for, for giving way. Many constituents of mine, businesses in Midlothian, have contacted me. They are very, very worried about the grave danger of a no-deal Brexit and the effect that will have. Could my right hon. Friend say what he thinks about the effect on, on our people across the country and on businesses of a no-deal Brexit? Indeed, I was uh, with the Honourable Member last week in Scotland and we heard all of the concerns from many people about the debt of a no-deal Brexit, particularly those that trade extensively with Europe, about the damage it would do to their, their, bus <coughs> their businesses and the jobs that go with them. The right Honourable Member for giving way. He says he wants to avoid no-deal. But three times he's voted against the deal. Yeah. Exactly yeah. what changes? Exactly yeah. what changes to the withdrawal agreement would he like to see if he would ever vote for it? And I think I'm right in saying on two occasions I voted alongside the Prime Minister against those deals as well. So um, what but Mr Speaker I understand that there are, I'll come, I'll come back to, I'll do some more, I'll give away a bit later on, okay? I understand there are people from all sides of the House under a great deal of pressure in what is regrettably an extremely volatile political climate. But if you truly trust in what all the analysis shows, including the government's own analysis, as was demonstrated earlier, if you believe in what the experts say and you understand that a no-deal Brexit will be a disaster for this country, then you must act now. With that in mind, I want to pay tribute to those who have shown the political courage to boldly stand up for what they believe in to bring this debate to the House. The bullying and the threats to MPs opposite from their own side is unprecedented. But let me offer some words of encouragement. Let me just offer. It's all right, I'm trying to help you. Let me offer you some words of encouragement. Standing by your principles doesn't always damage your future prospects. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
the way they do. Thank the Right Honourable Member for giving way, but can I suggest that he's careful with his selection of evidence? The Treasury, the IMF, the Bank of England all made predictions of doom and gloom if we voted to leave in 2016, and they said there'd be economic disaster by December, by Christmas 2016. They were all wrong. What's happened since is record unemployment, record manufacturing output and record investment in the full knowledge that no deal is better than a bad deal. I thank the member for that intervention. The only problem is it flies in the face of all facts as they're published day in, day out. The value of the pound is falling, manufacturing industry is falling, and I'll come on to a number of other industries that are seriously at threat. But, Mr Speaker, I also pay tribute to those people across all parties who have come together and continue to work to make a stand against this Government's reckless and shambolic approach. The Prime Minister says now it is not the time for Parliament to make this stand. He says the chances of a Brexit deal are improving and that the outlines of an agreement are in the making. Yet, Mr Speaker, all the evidence points to the contrary. So far, in its six weeks in office, this Government has spent more time trying to avoid scrutiny and trying to silence Parliament than focusing on getting a good deal for this country. And with weeks to go until we crash out of the European Union, they have failed to bring forward any new proposals, especially with regard to the Irish backstop. Even, even if they had worked up new plans or presented a way forward, it seems very unlikely the EU would agree to the Prime Minister's red line of scrapping the backstop. As the Attorney General reportedly put it, such a proposition would be a complete fantasy. The reality is there has been no progress made in Brussels, nor is there likely to be. This reckless government only has one plan, to crash out of the EU without a deal, at whatever price to our industry, to people's jobs and to people's living standards. I have given way many times on that side, and I will continue. And that is why so many people across this House will stand up to say no to no deal. It has been exposed today, as reported in The Telegraph, which says the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff called negotiations a sham, and the real strategy was to run down the clock. That is why it is incumbent on us, as Members of Parliament, to act today. Voting to block no deal will not kill the positive momentum in Brexit negotiations because there is no momentum in the Brexit negotiations to kill. What we are asking MPs today to do is rule out playing Russian roulette with this country's future. With our industry, with our National Health Service and with people's jobs and livelihoods all at stake for their trying to retain power. Let's not forget what no deal means for this country. No deal will decimate our manufacturing industry. No deal will destroy our agricultural sector. I thank my way. And I'm sure my honourable friend knows that the West Midlands group of MPs have had lots of consultations. In fact, we've got a meeting tomorrow again with businesses in the West Midlands because they're concerned about the implications of no deal. Will my honourable friend not agree with me? It's imperative we get a proper deal to safeguard the millions of jobs up and down the country, but particularly West Midlands and Coventry. Indeed, my friend is right. The West Midlands will be particularly hard hit because so much of its industry relies on just-in-time deliveries from the continent as well as exports to them and a manufacturing process that, if any interruption happens whatsoever, there is chaos immediately at the point of production as well as the transport system that supplies those places. There has to be some realistic understanding in this House of the implications of a no-deal Brexit on the West Midlands as well as on other parts of this country. No deal. I, no, I've, I've given way many times to many people, and I'm sure the honourable member will make a wonderful contribution when he gets to make his speech. No deal threatens peace and stability in Northern Ireland, and threatens our policing and counter-terrorism cooperation with Europe. 
No deal will mean food shortages and medical shortages, and it will bring chaos to our ports and transport networks. When earlier on we had a minister at the dispatch box proudly telling us that a thousand more staff have been employed in order to deal with congestion that will be happening at the Channel ports. Isn't that an indication of the Government's own admission of what the problems are going to be by leaving with no deal? Our economy is already fragile. The economy contracted in the last quarter. Manufacturing has contracted at the fastest pace for seven years, and a no deal would accelerate that decline. Now is not the time, as I said, to play Russian roulette with our economy. These aren't the warnings, Mr Speaker, of some ultra-remain group. These are warnings outlined in the Government's own assessment and the warnings of leading industry figures. You don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to listen to me if you don't want to. Instead, instead listen to the likes of Make UK, who represent 20,000 UK manufacturing industry co companies, who have said leaving without a deal would be, and I quote, the height of economic lunacy. Listen to the National Farmers Union, which said a no deal would, and I quote, have a devastating impact on British food and farming and must be avoided at all costs. Or listen to the British Medical Association, which has made it clear, and again I quote, the consequences of no deal could have potentially catastrophic consequences for patients, the health workforce and services, and the nation's health. We must listen to what every sector of society is telling us regarding the damage of a no-deal Brexit and what it will do to our society and our economy. If we, as a Parliament, don't make this stand today, there may not be another opportunity. It may simply be too late. We must listen to those warnings. If people in the House know better than the BMA, the NFU, Make UK about their own sectors, or know better than the trade unions that represent people working in those plants and delivery facilities all over the country, they should say so now. I have met trade unionists all over the country over the last few months and spoken to the TUC about it. They are all deeply worried about the continued job losses in manufacturing because of the uncertainty that no deal will bring. I understand there will be some concerns regarding the potential bill which may follow this debate. Some concern from members across the House that supporting such a bill would be an attempt to block Brexit or reversing the results of the 2016 referendum. That is actually not the case. This bill, this bill does not close other options to resolve the Brexit impasse. This bill is about preventing a damaging no deal which this Government has no mandate for and for which there is very little public support. The bill is designed purely to provide vital breathing space to find an alternative way through the Brexit mess. This and the previous Government have created. Today, Mr Speaker, is another historic day in Parliament. It is our chance to seize this last opportunity, to stand up to a bullying Government that has shown itself ready to dodge scrutiny and silence debate. If we do not act today, we may not get another chance. Whether people voted leave or remain, they did not vote to shut down democracy, as the very large numbers of people who were on the streets last Saturday from both Leave and Remain views were very concerned about the way in which this Government is trying to shut down debate, shut down democracy and lead us into what I believe would be the problems of a no-deal Brexit. So, Mr Speaker, I urge, I urge all MPs today to do what they believe to be right for their constituents, their jobs, their living standards and their communities, and support this proposal today that we may debate the bill tomorrow and prevent a no-deal Brexit with all the damage this would do to our community and our society. Yeah. Yeah. The leader of the
the House, Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and it's a pleasure to be speaking in this debate, um, brought to us by the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Dorset West, and to follow, of course, the Leader of Her Majesty's Opposition. The Prime Minister has said, including in his statement earlier, this Government is absolutely committed to delivering Brexit on 31 October. We must deliver the largest democratic mandate in the nation's history. Delivering the referendum result requires this House to respect the voice of the people as expressed in that historic vote, and so far the House has failed to do so. And now, instead of backing the Prime Minister and giving him the best possible chance of securing a deal before the UK leaves the European Union on 31 October, we find ourselves debating a proposition that seeks to confound the referendum result again. Mr Speaker, I wish to be clear. What is proposed today is constitutionally irregular, and I will of course give way. I'm grateful for him uh, giving way. Could he remind the House how many times did he vote against the deal? (coughs) The deal is dreadful. It's why the Prime Minister is getting a better one, if only the House would let him. But this is irregular both in terms of the approach to allowing SO24s on substantive motions and in terms of the subversion of Parliament's proper role in scrutinising and the executive in initiating. I give way to the Honourable Lady. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am enormously grateful to the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman for allowing me to intervene upon him. Um, He will know the importance of the Good Friday Agreement to the people of Northern Ireland, and he will also know, as a unionist, that without a deal there will be an inevitable hardening of the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, which will incentivise Sinn Féin to agitate for a border poll to take Northern Ireland out of the United Kingdom and into the Republic of Ireland, into United Ireland. How on earth could the right hand of a gentleman defend the indefensible? Because, Mr Speaker, I simply disagree with the Honourable Lady that there would have to be a political desire to impose a hard border, and neither the United Kingdom nor the Government of the Republic of Ireland has such a desire. I'll, of course, I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I thank the Right Honourable Gentleman for giving way. I appreciate that. I have a certain fondness for him from our time on the R&R Committee some years ago. Um, I'll tell the Right Honourable Gentleman what is constitutionally <laughs> irregular, and that is shutting down Parliament, uh-huh. shutting down debate, yeah. and, and yeah. shutting down the ability of MPs yeah, to hold this government to account. So can the right honourable gentleman tell me when it was that he became aware of the Prime Minister's plan to shut down ah, Parliament in order to force through ah, a no deal Brexit? Yeah, because yeah. papers in the court of session today suggest yeah. it was the Prime Minister's plan on the 16th of August. Ah. Ah. Mr Speaker, as Parliament is not being shut down, cannot be shut down, I could not be aware of plans to do something that is not happening. <laughs> so the honourable gentleman should be wrong. I'll give way to my honourable friend. My right honourable friend will be aware that the majority of members, colleagues, voting uh, against the government tonight voted to trigger Article 50, which said that we would leave the EU with or without a deal. It was very simple, very clear. Which bit does he think they now don't understand? Speaker, I think they don't like losing referendums and they never accepted it. But I must come back to the constitutional issue because this motion risks subverting Parliament's proper role in scrutinising and the executive in initiating. And Mr Speaker, you particularly have a grave responsibility, of which I know you are well aware, to uphold the norms and conventions that underpin our constitution. But we all have a role to play, and it does considerable damage when some of us choose to subvert rather than reinforce, to hinder rather than to polish our constitution. I, give way to I, I thank the, uh, the Leader of the House for giving way, and he's talking about uh, the alleged subversion of democracy. I'm going to ask it very, very clearly. He seemed to not answer the uh, honourable gentleman along the way. On what date did he first become aware of the plan? to prorogue 
Parliament? And secondly, could he tell us whether any officials from his office, 10 Downing Street, others, whether political advisers or civil servants, have been conducting communications away from normal channels um, in such a way that that would not uh, comply with the terms of candour and disclosure necessary for the court proceedings which are currently taking place? Well, if people were carrying out discussions without candour, I wouldn't know about them, so I therefore wouldn't be able to tell the honourable gentleman if they'd happened or not. But I carry out all my discussions with candour, and if anybody is interested, the Privy Council's uh, function is reported uh, in the court sector. I'll give way to my right honourable friend. Uh, my right honourable right friend is being extremely generous, and I'm grateful to him for giving way. If we were to leave the EU on a no-deal basis, effectively that would mean that we would operate on WTO rules. Given that the EU currently operates with a number of countries on WTO rules, including the US, China, Russia, Argentina, Australia, New Zealand and many other countries, would my right hon. Friend agree with me that we should not be as fearful to trade on WTO rules outside the EU, given that we are already trading on WTO rules in the EU? My right hon. Friend makes a brilliant and incisive point, and he is absolutely Right, so we need to examine what is being put forward to the House and to consider this very concerning and odd aspect that it is actually being permitted in the first place. Let us look, Mr Speaker, at SO24 and the approach we are taking. As you know, I take an interest in the rules of the House. Oh, of course, I'll give way to my right hand learned friend. I, I, I knew he would. He's always made perfect courtesy. Very grateful. And I was just astonished to hear him agree that we'd be perfectly all right proceeding on WTO rules. Uh, does he accept that WTO rules will require the European Union to apply tariffs against our agriculture, fisheries and much of our manufacturing in line with the tariffs they impose against other third-party countries? And WTO rules will require us to have a closed border in Ireland to order to enforce those restrictions. You can't have it one way or another. You either obey the WTO rules or you ignore those as well and We're pretend there's some fat never never land you're going into. But you can't simply accept calmly the argument that WTO rules would do no damage to our economy. Well, I must confess, Mr. Speaker, I'm surprised by my right honourable learned friend's astonishment because I've been making the case for WTO rules for some time. It has been a, a very sensible way to proceed and will allow us to carry on trading as we do with many other countries. Um, but my right honourable learned friend also wished to intervene. Well, I, I, I'm most grateful to my right honourable friend for giving way. It, he says that the House's role is one of scrutiny, and I agree. And yet, does he not see that there is an incompatibility between that scrutiny and, in fact, taking steps through prorogation to deprive us of the effective opportunity of carrying it out? And when considering that, he may also agree with me that so much in this House depends on trust. How can we have trust when there have already been a number of examples of the government making inaccurate statements, such as, for example, that the papers prepared for its briefing in Yellowhammer were the, were the product of a previous administration when they were not, and secondly, and perhaps uh, most pertinently, over prorogation, when it appears that the facts as stated by the government as to the reasons of prorogation have turned out to be entirely inaccurate, now causing the government considerable difficulties over its duty of candour in litigation. Now, when you aggregate all that together, perhaps my right honourable friend might begin to understand why many of us have finally decided that this House must take action. Yeah, yeah. And my, my right honourable friend is very learned, but his learning doesn't always lead him in the right direction. The prorogation is completely routine. The opposition front bench, when I was first and indeed last at this dispatch box, was asking for the session to be brought to an end. We were merely being our obliging selves, Mr Speaker, in leading forth to a new key speech in the general course of events, in due course, because we always like to hear from the Honourable Gentleman, the member for the Ronda, who informs and educates us when he speaks. But I know. <laughs> 
We are going to have to wait, Mr. Speaker, for this informing and educating. We are all baiting our breath for it, but I like to keep people on tenterhooks for the time being because I wish to talk about Erskine May, our old friend. And this sets out, Mr. Speaker, your role and the chief characteristic attached to the office of Speaker in the House of Commons are authority and impartiality. And it would be disorderly, wrong, and not my intention to question your impartiality. But, like the umpires at Edgbaston, who saw eight of their decisions sent for review and overturned, accepting somebody's impartiality is not the same as accepting their infallibility. And it is worth noting what a wise and scholarly speaker once said. Indeed, this wise and scholarly speaker said as recently as last year that a debate held under Standing Order No. 24 could only be held on a substantive and amendable motion if the Standing Order is itself amended. In April 2008, in the light of two emergency debates on the UK's decision to take military action in Syria, you yourself said it is perfectly open to the House to amend Standing Order No. 24, of which there is some uncertainty and often incomprehension. It could be amended to allow for the tabling of substantive motions in circumstances of emergency, which could also be amendable and on which the House could vote. If there are any members who are interested in that line of inquiry, they could usefully raise it with the Chair of the Procedure Committee. As far as I am aware, no change has been made to Standing Order 24, yet the decision has changed. Various et mutabilis semper dicta. But now I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Well, the Leader of the House said earlier that Parliament isn't being suspended. But actually, in this case, it is. He knows perfectly well that select committees will not be able to sit. There will be absolutely no proceedings of Parliament, as according to the Bill of Rights. There will be no proceedings of Parliament whilst Parliament is prorogued. I want Parliament to prorogue, but I only want it to prorogue for four or five days so that we can do our job of scrutinising the government through proceedings in Parliament. That's the point. We want a Queen's speech, but we want to be able to come back and do our job. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman knows the procedures of this House only too well. He knows that we were about to go, in some cases, to the seaside for party conferences, in the case of my party, to a major city centre. And that is why we are taking three, four or five days of parliamentary time and simply going over the um, normal recess. That is not in any sense an abuse, and I will give way to my Honourable Friend. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm very grateful to the Leader for giving way. Could he go back to his point about Standing Order uh, 24? I mean, it does seem to me he's absolutely quite, quite correct, and the Speaker in his previous statement was correct, that this could not be on a, subta on a substantive motion. Now, if this motion is carried tonight, which appears to be a substantive motion, it seems to me the Government would have every right to declare it ultra virus and ignore it. Yeah. Order. Uh, order. I know that the Honourable Gentleman won't presume to argue with the judgment of the Chair, entitled as he is to the possession and expression of his opinion. And what I would say to the Honourable Gentleman, in order to help him and to assist the Leader of the House, is this. If in the judgment of the Chair a motion understanding Order No. 24 is expressed in neutral terms, it will not be open to amendment if it is judged to be expressed in neutral terms. The reality of the matter is there have been previous occasions upon which there have been Standing Order No. 24 motion debates which have contained what I would prefer to call evaluative motions, notably, with which I feel sure the Leader is familiar, on the 18th of March 2013 and on the 11th of December 2018. It is in conformity with that practice that I have operated. I have taken advice of a professional kind, and I am entirely satisfied that the judgment that I have made is consistent with that advice. My attitude is simply to seek to facilitate the House. 
The leader rightly referred to my responsibility, which was grave and solemn. I completely accept that, as well as I accept his right to his own view about my judgment in this matter. I have sought to exercise my judgment in discharging my responsibility to facilitate the House of Commons, to facilitate the legislature. I have done it, I am doing it, and I will do it to the best of my ability, without fear or favour, to coin a phrase, come what may, do or die. The Leader of the House. I am grateful. I am grateful, as always, Mr Speaker, for your contribution to the debate, and it is always very useful that your words should be referred to and reminded to the House where it was suggested by you that this matter should be referred to the Procedure Committee and the motion amended, which it has not been. There is so much to say and so little time, others will want to speak. This motion, in a number of ways, is extraordinary. I will, of course, give way to the Honourable Learned Lady. I'm very grateful to the Right Honourable Gentleman for giving way. I wonder if I might go back to the matter raised by the Right Honourable Learned Member for Beaconsfield. It was revealed in court this morning in a case raised in my name and that of 70 other members of this House that on the 16th of August, the Prime Minister agreed to a suggestion that Parliament should be prorogued on the 9th of September. But on the 25th of August, a number 10 spokesperson said the claim that the government is considering proroguing Parliament in September in order to stop MPs debating Brexit is entirely false. Does the right honourable gentleman accept that the spokesperson misled MPs and the public on the 25th of August? Well, I'm sorry to say, Mr Speaker. That the most obvious understanding of the ordinary use of the English language, which normally the Honourable Lady is pretty good at, makes it quite clear that the two statements are entirely compatible. The prorogation is the normal prorogation to have a new session. It is not to stop debate uh, on matters related to the European Union. And it is, of course, a pleasure to give way to the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for the Hilling and Anyar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable gentleman for giving way. The right honourable gentleman for giving way. Now, the honourable right honourable gentleman spoke earlier about candour, and the need for candour means that he has to accept that when it comes to WTO, all countries bar about three in the world are in regional trade associations, and the three that aren't are roughly South Sudan, Somalia, and East Timor. Probably soon joined if a hard Brexit comes by the UK. But given that these countries, every other bar three, are in regional trade associations, that means they don't exclusively trade at WTO. So the place that he talks about, when he talks about WTO, he's taking the UK to a place of exclusively trading on WTO, which is moving out of free trade with 500 million people to make trade more expensive with 500 million people. That's his policy. Now, the other question, did he know about irrigation on the 16th of August? 16th of August, I was at Lord's watching a game of cricket, unless it was one of the days when it rained. Um, but on the WTO issue, our trade with the United States on WTO terms, and I know the Honourable Gentleman is an expert in these matters, has grown faster since the creation of the single market than our trade with the European Union. But I understand my right honourable friend wishes to intervene. I am very grateful to my right honourable friend for giving way. I, I understand his views and his concerns about the constitutional, supposed constitutional irregularity of these proceedings, and no doubt in the future all these things can be debated. Will he accept that we stand as a nation at present, uh, at a moment which will have a profound effect on the welfare of our people, and that the sovereign parliament of this country clearly deserves an opportunity to be able to decide whether it will accept a policy of no-deal exit or not, and that that overwhelmingly matters more than whether the uh, Standing Order 24B clause with where in it, no, misdrafted stop. in all probability no. by the then Leader of the House, has a particular meaning or does not have a particular no, meaning. Yeah. 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 There is, Mr Speaker, I'm sorry to say, a stunning arrogance to that view. Yeah. And it fails, it fails to understand where 
sovereignty comes from. So I do indeed dare to say this, and I say that to the right honourable gentleman. Because order, order, order. The Order. I, I recognise that there are strongly held views on both sides of the House on all aspects of this matter, but the Leader of the House must be heard. The Leader. Mr Speaker, sovereignty in this House comes from the British people, and the idea that we can overrule 17.4 million people is preposterous, and the idea, and the idea, the idea that our rules do not exist to protect the people from arrogant power grabs is mistaken. Those rules are there for the protection of the people. I have given way so many times and to many distinguished members, and it is now time to come on to this motion which is extraordinary and unprecedented. Parliament is attempting to set aside Standing Order No. 14 to give precedence to the EU Withdrawal No. 6 Bill. This motion goes further and seeks to claim an unknown and unquantified number of subsequent days for consideration of Lords' amendments and messages. It is a fundamental principle that Government is able to transact its business in this House, a principle this House has long accepted in Standing Order No. 14. This motion also sets aside in a new parliamentary session the standing orders that apply in relation to the presentation of private members' bills. The motion would allow a designated member, few of the Illuminati who are taking the powers to themselves, to give notice of presentation of this bill on the first day of the new session and then provide time for debate on this bill on the second day of the new session, interrupting the Queen's speech. There is an established process for the House debating the Queen's speech, a process that this bill would undermine. While the Outlawry's Bill has its first reading just before the start of the Queen's speech debate, this bill is only read a first time as a formality and not debated. To interrupt the Queen's speech to debate a backbench bill such as the one proposed in this motion would be unprecedented. The Government has an obligation to bring forward its business, and the Queen's speech and the debate that follows is one of the great set pieces of the parliamentary calendar where the government is rightly scrutinised and held to account, and this is being interrupted. And I give way to the very patient Honourable Gentleman. Well, right, Honourable Gentleman, for giving way, but I wanted to come back to a point made by the Honourable Gentleman from Wellingborough. The Honourable Gentleman said quite a lot as a Brexiteer that we would be taking back control of our laws. So can he be crystal clear at the dispatch box tonight that if the bill passes in this House and passes another way, the government will not stop that getting royal assent yeah, if we're yeah, taking yeah. back control of our laws? Yeah, 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 yeah. The law will be followed. This country is a country that follows the rule of law, and this government assiduously follows constitutional conventions, unlike some other members of this House. But I understand the um, Honourable Gentleman from Stone wishes to intervene. Uh, isn't what could only be described as a breathtaking intervention by the member for West Dorset just now, and in support of my right honourable friend's assertion that it was weighed with great arrogance, uh, would my right honourable friend be good enough to confirm that, in fact, the referendum bill as enacted was a sovereign act of Parliament which deliberately gave the right to the British people and not to the British Parliament to make the decision on the question of remain or leave? Well, the honourable gentleman is, of course, right, and we report to the British people anyway. They are our bosses, and the honourable lady has been so patient. I'd like to thank him for giving way. In fact, the bigger picture. The Prime Minister made it very clear in a speech last night and in a statement today that his preferred outcome is to leave with a deal. Can the Leader of the House confirm that that is also his preferred outcome and that if a deal is agreed at the next European Council, sufficient time will be made in this chamber to make sure that we've legislated for that deal? Uh, the Honourable Lady is absolutely right, and I can say both personally and as bound by collective responsibility that I am in favour 
of a deal. Um, we, must, we must allow other people to speak. I, I see that timed winged chariot is speeding away, and therefore I must get on to the separation of um, powers. Well, if, if, if the honourable gentleman wants me to carry on all night, I'll do my best. But the debate we are having today goes to the heart of our constitution and the roles of the executive and parliament. These are matter, matters of careful balance. It is for government, by virtue of its ability to command the confidence of this House, to exercise executive power. This includes the order of business and bringing forward legislation. It is for Parliament to scrutinise, to amend, to reject or to approve. Indeed, the scrutiny of the executive is one of the core functions of Parliament. These complementary and distinctive roles are essential to the functioning of the Constitution. Ministers are, of course, accountable to Parliament for their decisions and actions, and Parliament can make clear its views. It is not, however, for Parliament to undertake the role and functions of the executive. Constitutional convention is that executive power is exercised by Her Majesty's Government, which has a democratic mandate to govern. That mandate is derived from the British people and represented through this House. And, Mr Speaker, when we look at this Constitution, we are protected by our rules and by our orders and by our conventions. We will remember from a man from all seasons that it is those rules, those laws, those conventions that protect us from the winds of tyranny. And if we take away those protections, as the right honourable gentleman proposes, we lose our protections. And it is therefore on the basis of this convention that the government, not Parliament, is responsible for the negotiations with the European Union. Parliament as a whole cannot negotiate for the UK. This is the role of the government in exercising executive power to give effect to the will of the nation. These roles are fundamental and underpin the country's uncodified constitution. The government draws power from Parliament. The government draws power from Parliament, but the government, the government, the government may at any time be removed by the tried and tested motion of a confidence debate. And the fact that Parliament has not been willing to go down this route, the fact that the opposition are afraid of this route, the fact that the opposition run away from the confidence vote route is because they do not dare have the leader of the opposition at head of the government. They are frightened. The Honourable Lady says there is time. Let me say as Leader of the House that if they want a motion of confidence, this Government will always make time for it and obey the Constitutional Convention. But they are afraid. They are white with fear because they do not want the right Honourable Gentleman to be uh, in 10 Downing Street. And I will now give way to my Honourable Friend. I am very grateful to my right honourable, honourable friend. Will he agree with me that if this House succeeds in stripping our Prime Minister of the key negotiating card of a no deal, the likelihood of our, that outcome will be that much accentuated? Thank you. Yes, it makes the negotiations much harder. My honourable friend is right, absolutely right. But now let us turn to the substance of what we are debating. Ostensibly, the purpose of the bill is to stop no deal. But the government wants a deal. We are willing to sit down with the Commission and EU member states to talk about what needs to be done and to achieve a deal. This must involve the excision of the anti-democratic backstop. The government has also been clear that we must respect the referendum result and the UK will be leaving the EU on the 31st of October, whatever the circumstances, unless, unless and until the EU agrees to negotiate, we will be leaving with no deal on the 31st of October. My right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, has made a statement earlier today in which he informed the House of all that is being done to ensure we are ready for all eventualities. The good Boy Scouts that we are, we are prepared, and I will definitely give way to the Honourable Lady. I, will give you I thank the Right Honourable Gentleman uh, for giving way. Does he not realise that in proroguing Parliament for five weeks, 
which is the longest prorogation right in the middle of a political crisis that there has been since 1945. His government and he have deliberately prevented scrutiny that would be legitimate in this House, hence uh, the situation we find ourselves in now. And will he, uh, when he gets back up at that dispatch box, confirm that if this bill is passed through this House and passes the other place, he will speed the royal assent and his government will not act against the law. I, I don't wish to be pedantic, uh, Mr Speaker, but it's one of the constitutional niceties that it's Her Majesty's Government, it's not mine, um, and it is led by my right hon friend, the member for Uxbridge. But the important issue here is that prorogation is a routine start for a new session. We are losing a similar number of days, a similar number of days that we would lose for a normal prorogation. I will give way to the. Oh, oh, I, I'm afraid the Honourable Lady, I will give way to her, but she is trumped momentarily by the Chairman of the Brexit Select Committee. Extremely grateful to the Leader of the House for giving way. Now that the Speaker has made it clear that there is nothing irregular at all about his acceptance of this motion, and given that I presume the Leader of the House accepts that the House is in charge of its own procedures, how can there be anything constitutionally irregular if the House chooses to pass this motion and then the bill tomorrow in the House choosing to instruct the Government that there is an outcome to the Brexit negotiations that the House is not prepared to accept, which is leaving without a deal on the 31st of October? The Honourable Gentleman conflates irregular and proper. This is unquestionably irregular even though it is not improper, and the two are different uh, concepts, which the Right Honourable Gentleman, I am sure, fully understands. It is, of course, for this House to regulate its own proceedings, but a fundamental principle of our Constitution is that the Government commands the confidence of this House. If this are, from a sedentary position, an Honourable Gentleman says it does not. Now, that is the lock that would undo this constitutional conundrum because the House dare not say it has no confidence in the government. It is frightened of that, and therefore it tries to take away confidence on specifics whilst maintaining confidence in the generality. That is not a proper constitutional position to be in. And I, 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 it's very difficult to choose who to give in way to, but I promise the Honourable Lady. He has referred many times in his speech to the accountability. And within that vein of accountability, can I ask him a simple question? On what date did he become aware of the Prime Minister's intention to prorogue Parliament? Yes, I've, been asked, I've been asked that uh, question, and I understand there are papers in court. And I, I don't know when I was told that this was happening, though I did have to get a, I had to get a flight. I had to get a flight up to Aberdeen uh, for a meeting of the Privy Council, um, but without consulting my diary and my telephone records, I would not wish to say something that was inaccurate. But let us get back to what, what is happening here. I was saying that we are the Good Boy Scouts. We are well prepared for leaving with or without a deal. And it is absurd for MPs to attempt to bind the hands of the Prime Minister as he seeks to agree a deal they can support ahead of the European Council. Europe, the European Union withdrawal bill makes it harder to deliver the two things the public wants from Brexit. Certainty is one of them, and for it to be delivered. The bill does not do this. It is nothing but legislative ledger domain and a vehicle for extension after extension. I will give way to the Honourable Lady, who has been very patient. I, I thank my right honourable friend for giving way. My constituents in Sleaford and North Highcombe voted overwhelmingly to leave and are very concerned about the bill proposed for tomorrow that they, that they can see would block Brexit. Could my right honourable friend confirm my understanding that if, um, if this bill were to pass, the options available would be to the EU, and they would be to, one, agree a largely pointless three-month extension, which would cer almost certainly be repeated, two, offer a deal of their choice, not negotiated by our government, or no deal. 
Does my right hon. Friend agree with me that that is not taking back control for this Parliament or for this Government, but ceding it entirely to Brussels? My hon. Friend is absolutely right, because what is happening is a deliberate attempt to say the seed for an extension long enough for a second rep- referendum or simply to stop us leaving at all. It is about denying Brexit yeah. and the fact that the Bill mandates updates on negotiations and motions on those updates on a rolling 28-day basis clearly envisages either a lengthy extension or possibly indefinite vassalage. And these seeds could grow into legislation to be introduced on the 15th of January, the 12th of February and then every 28 days thereafter to command the government to ha- take specific actions. The aim is to create a marionette government in which there is only nominal confidence and it defies the convention in what we are doing today, a convention of great importance that emergency legislation is only passed when there is a consensus. Governments less benign than this one in future may learn from this process and ram through any legislation they feel like. Without consensus, emergency legislation is something those on the opposition benches should be very careful about, for they may find they are at the wrong end of it uh, in future. And we should be trying to help the Prime Minister in his chance to negotiate, not trying to bind him hand and foot. Not only do we want to be the vassal state of the European Union, we wish to send the Prime Minister bound hand and foot to go and negotiate with them. Mr Speaker, you will be glad to know, Mr Speaker, that I am drawing gently to a close, and therefore I fear the time for interventions, except from my very old friend, the Honourable uh, Lady, Right Honourable Lady, um, the um, Chairman of the uh, very distinguished committee that she's Chairman of. Send him a note. Mr Speaker, for once the right honourable gentleman has made an error and he's over-promoted me, but I thank him for his uh, distinctive comments. There's a serious point here. We are a representative democracy, yes. not yes. a direct democracy. Absolutely. And I take that judgment seriously, as I know do colleagues across the House. The government does not have a majority. We are in uncharted constitutional yeah, territory. Yeah. So it is absolutely right and proper that we exercise our judgment in the interests of the country to avoid, at the very least, a no deal Brexit. Well, so, for all of the talk from the Honourable Member, Right Honourable Member, we must exercise that judgment. That is what we're doing. It is entirely responsible. Yeah. 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 I'm afraid I disagree with the Honourable Lady, and I must confess I'm astonished that she's not a Right Honourable. Um, something must have gone wrong with the Privy Council, of which I'm now Lord President. It is not to be the case. Um, <laughs> Honourable Member from Rhonda feels he has also not been justly promoted. I am sorry. Um, but, 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 but I don't think the Leader of the House was planning to invite the Honourable Lady to join him in Balmoral, as far as I'm aware. So I'm not sure it makes a great deal of difference in the immediate circumstance. The Leader of the House. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. But I'm afraid the Honourable Lady is wrong because there is a routine constitutional procedure to deal with that, and that is the vote of confidence. And yes, we are a representative body, but where does our sovereignty come from? And here I'm in agreement with the Scots. Sovereignty comes from the people to Parliament. We hold it in trust for them, and they gave us an instruction. And if we follow this route, we are left with but three options. We then have to accept the deal with its anti-democratic backstop. We have to keep on extending because Parliament would never accept that we are ready to leave or we could simply revoke and tell 17.4 million people that they were wrong. The approach taken today is the most unconstitutional use of this House since the days of Charles Stuart Parnell when he tried to bung up Parliament. Usurping the executive's right is unconstitutional. The abuse of emergency debates to do so is unconstitutional, and the bill itself is yet more unconstitutional. A. V. Dicey said all conventions have one ultimate object to secure that Parliament or the Cabinet shall, in the long run, give effect to the will of the people. These conventions are being disregarded today. And so, by extension, is the will of the nation. Parliament sets itself against the people. Sovereignty comes from the people to Parliament. It does not come to Parliament out of a void. If Parliament tries to challenge the people, 
This stretches the elastic of our Constitution near to breaking point. We should recognise that the people are our masters and show us to be their lieges and servants, not to place ourselves in the position of their overlords. As we come to vote today, I hope all members, Mr Speaker, will contemplate the current constitutional confusion and consider the chaos this concatenation of circumstances could create. Mr Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is a pleasure to follow the Leader of the House. I should remind him that Lord Cooper in the Court of Session said that parliamentary sovereignty is a purely English concept that has no counterpart in Scottish constitutional history. In Scotland, yeah, yeah, yeah. the people are sovereign, yeah, yeah. and that, of course, will be a matter of importance as the people of Scotland decide what their future will be. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, Mr Speaker, that I am rather surprised by the right honourable gentleman, who has always been a student of the rights of this House, because the harsh reality is the reason that we are in the situation that Parliament has been prorogued is because the Prime Minister has instructed three stooges to go to Balmoral to give an instruction to the Queen to shut this place down. And for all these pronouncements that this is normal, it most certainly is not normal for Parliament to be prorogued for five weeks. And we know the simple reason is because the Government is running away from the powers and responsibilities that this House has. It is shameful. It is disgraceful. And in that regard, I am deeply honoured and privileged to endorse the motion in the name of the member for West Dorset. Mr Speaker, today the Scottish Government has launched an ambitious programme for government aimed at tackling climate change, building a fairer economy, Mm -hmm. reducing inequality and improving the lives of citizens across Scotland. Mr Speaker, a government getting on with its day job, 12 years into government yet still focused on making life better for those in Scotland. But while government in Holyrood is stepping up to meet the challenges facing both Scotland and the world, Westminster is quite literally shutting down. There is very much a tale of two governments. While the SNP is doing everything here and in Edinburgh to move Scotland forward, the threat to our economy and society from the right-wing Brexiteer cabal occupying Downing Street exactly cannot so. be mitigated yeah, away. Yeah, Mr yeah, Speaker, yeah. they must, they will be stopped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A sham is what reports say of the Prime Minister's advisers have called his EU negotiation strategy. Running down the clock is what the Telegraph is reporting those close to the Prime Minister say his strategy is. Mm-hmm. A complete fantasy reports say the Attorney General advising the Prime Minister of his approach to the backstop. Mr Speaker, the tall tales of this Prime Minister are being exposed by the media by the minute. Sources are exposing the smoke and mirrors behind those playing games in number 10. Does the Prime Minister think this is a game? If so, it is a very, very dangerous game. Make no mistake, the Prime Minister is acting like a dictator shutting down Parliament, ripping up democracy and silencing the people. I give way. Honourable gentleman, for giving way, and he's making some very strong points. Um, would you agree with me that if the government was serious about negotiating, and there were serious negotiations going on, then the negotiation team wouldn't have been cut to a quarter of the size of what it was under the previous Prime Minister, and you wouldn't have meetings going on where the chief negotiator is saying that the rationale for talking to the Brexit team in the EU is domestic political handling. My honourable friend is absolutely correct. It is a complete sham to say that negotiations are taking place. This is simply a government that is driving us towards no deal, and Parliament, thankfully, is standing up for its rights. The Prime Minister seems to have forgotten in this place we have been elected to represent the will of our constituents, and we on these benches have been elected to serve the people of Scotland. The people of Scotland who have overwhelmingly voted to remain in the European Union. Yet this Prime Minister, by proroguing Parliament, has decided to ignore the will of the Scottish people, sideline their interests and silence their voices. And I say to the Scottish Conservative members, don't stab Scotland in the back tonight. Stand together with us. For once, for once, 
stand up for Scotland's interests. While the Prime Minister clearly thinks he can do whatever he wants with Scotland and get away with it, the SNP is here today to tell him that we aren't having it. Since coming to office, the Prime Minister has not given Parliament the opportunity to debate the constitutional crisis facing these islands. And despite Parliament previously ruling out leaving on a no-deal basis, the Prime Minister is peddling us towards the cliff edge, risking a no-deal Brexit, risking jobs, risking food and medicine supplies, the population of the United Kingdom being threatened by this Government. I'll give, I'll give way first to... Very, very good, Chairman. Give way. If the, the first observation I have about this government, it's amazing how much they're enthralled uh, to the date given to them by uh, Donald Tusk of the 31st of October. It's now become sacrosanct for Brexiteers, that EU date. But the other thing that strikes me about this government is they're looking to have a jingoistic pre-hard Brexit election. But are they are fearing a post-Brexit election when there are empty shelves and lacks of medicines because a lack of... Lack of food on the shelves and a lack of medicines do not election victories make, and they will be decimated after they do the damage. So they want to cut and run and see if they can get over the line before they do the damage. My uh, honourable friend is, is correct, and the responsibility that this House has is to make sure that we don't have the catastrophe of a no deal Brexit, to protect yeah, yeah. us from that risk. And yes, we want an election, but we want an election safe in the knowledge that we protected our citizens Absolutely. from a no deal Brexit. Yeah. That is the right thing to do. And let's remind ourselves that the Prime Minister has not been elected by the people. He has been put in power by Conservative members. He should put himself in front of the people. But yeah, let's, yeah. in the first case, work together, work collectively to remove that cliff edge of the 31st of October. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. Does he recall very clearly, as I do, that on the 6th of April 2016, we were told by the current Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster that when, the day after we vote to leave the EU, we will hold all the cards? Does that not simply show that this government has been run by a hopeless, naive group of fantasists? I have to say, it grieves me to see what has taken place, because in effect what has happened with the election of the Prime Minister, that we've had the Vote Leave campaign that now runs the government. And the harsh reality is that Conservatives sitting on the back benches that are prepared to put our national interest before party interests are going to be forced out their party. What has happened, Mr Speaker? is that the Tory party have been taken over by a cult. And that does nothing, absolutely nothing, for our democracy. Yes. I'm very grateful to the right of the gentleman. Uh, he's completely right that Scotland would be harmed by a no deal, just as my constituents in Nottingham would be harmed by no deal. He's absolutely right to uh, say that this bill is required as an assurance policy against that no deal. But would he also agree that anything that dissolves Parliament before the 31st of October, whether it is uh, through prorogation or uh, a, a, a jingoistic election, as uh, the Honourable General from Nahil and Nahar suggested, would put at risk our constituents because there just is not the time to put all the legislation, the preparations in place, that insurance policy before the 31st of October. I think my honourable friend is right to signify that we are facing a constitutional crisis. And I, I want to applaud members of parliament right across this house that have worked together over the course of the last few weeks collectively because we understand the risk that there is to our economy. We understand the risk that there is to our communities. And thank goodness that members of Parliament have shown that desire to work across the House. Here, here. And we in the SNP have made it clear that we will work with everyone else. We will make sure that we remove that cliff edge. We have done that consistently ever since 2016. We want an election, but we want an election when we can get to that safe landing place, that we have that no deal taken off the table at the 31st yeah, yeah. of October. But I say this, and I no, mean, no way do I mean it as a threat to anyone in this House. The people of Scotland deserve the right to be able to determine their own future. We cannot allow ourselves to be taken out of the European Union against our will. We have a mandate 
from the 2016 Scottish election yeah. to deliver a referendum for the people of Scotland. And it is absolutely right that the people of my country that want to remain as a European nation should have that choice. And the Prime Minister and his Brexiteer cohorts are not going to drive Scotland out of the European Union. Yeah. Against yeah. Yeah. I'll give way one more time. I thank the right honourable member for giving way. Does he, like me, feel somewhat disrespected tonight by the contribution of the Leader of the House, who's yeah. disrespected our Speaker and his decisions, and everybody who has supported this motion? I'm proud to have my name on here. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. proud to stand with people who are willing to put country before party, country before self. I wasn't sent here by my constituents to make them poorer, to put their jobs at risk yeah, and their yeah. health care. And I think that's our overriding priority, that we are here to stop a no-deal Brexit. This isn't about whether we're Remainers or Brexiteers. No. Many people who voted for Brexit would continue to do so, but not for a no-deal Brexit. I believe there is mo no majority in the country or in this House for a no-deal bre Brexit, which is a disaster for the people of this country, yeah. of all four nations. I, I think the Honourable Lady makes a very passionate case, and we must reflect on what is in the Yellow Hammer document. It is not made up. It is not anybody on this side of the House. It is the government that recognises the risks that there are to the people of the United Kingdom. When you have, when you have a government that is telling us that there is a potential risk to food supplies, when you have a government that is telling us that there is a risk to medical supplies for those in particular that need epilepsy drugs, and good grief contained within the document, it talks about a limited risk to water supplies for hundreds of thousands of people. Just think about this. Think about a government that's telling the people of the United Kingdom that we cannot guarantee that you're going to have a water supply. Here, here. What on earth are we exactly. doing? Mr Speaker, the nub of this is that this is about ideology. And however people voted in the Brexit referendum, they certainly didn't vote for this. Here, here. And when you consider that the Treasury published a document last year that showed that a no-deal Brexit could reduce GDP over a 15-year period, by something close to 10 per cent. Just dwell on this. You are talking about an impact on the economy that is four times greater than the economic crisis of 2008, the economic crisis that ushered in a decade of austerity. It is the height of irresponsibility, the height of irresponsibility for any politician to think that we should be supporting no deal, yeah. putting constituents on the door. Mr Speaker, unemployment is never a price worth paying, yeah, but yeah. the Government are prepared to put the people of the United Kingdom on the door. We will not sit back and allow that to happen. One last time, and then I will make progress. The right Honourable Gentleman for giving way. He is making a very passionate case as to why no deal would be such a disaster. Does he agree with me that we have to, once and for all, dispense with this notion that it is some bargaining chip in these negotiations? Shooting yourself in the foot because you do not get what you want is not a negotiating position. I am grateful to the Honourable Gentleman, and he is absolutely correct. It is delusional, and they should start telling the truth to people. There will be no. One, one last time, one last, last time. I thank my right honourable friend for giving way, but does he agree with me that what we hear from Europe is there is not actually any proposal on the table from the government anyway? So there has been no serious negotiation to get a deal, and it is all literally a fairy tale and a sham. Well, I, I don't know what the Prime Minister believes when he was asked several times today by members in this House to tell us what proposition that the government is making. There is none. It is a sham. This is a government that is heading us towards the cliff edge of a no deal. That is the reality. Mr Speaker, the deepening of the democratic deficit under the Prime Minister is despicable. This decision is an outrageous assault on basic democratic principles. And yet the Prime Minister and his cronies will argue that this is normal. A suspension, he argues, is quite right and proper. What ridiculousness. Now, I know the Prime Minister has never been one to deal in facts. But let me make it clear for members. In the last 40 years, 
Parliament has never been prorogued for longer than three weeks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, in most cases, it has been prorogued for only a week or less. To try and argue that five weeks is normal, if we're being polite, is disingenuous. So, Mr. Speaker, the reason that we are here today, why we want, for a better phrase, are taking back control of the order uh -huh. paper. We are doing this on a cross-party basis to stop the Prime Minister from running down the clock and obstructing the right of our MPs, our democratic right, to debate, to vote and to represent the will of the people that sent us to this place. Yeah. The shameful act from the Prime Minister is because he knows there is no majority here for a no-deal Brexit, exactly. because he knows there is no support from the public for a no-deal Brexit because he knows what we all know, a no-deal Brexit is catastrophic for the lives of citizens across these islands. Just in office and the Prime Minister is toying with our democratic processes. Ruth Fox, director of the Hansard Society, said it was an affront to parliamentary democracy. And why, Mr Speaker? Because he, the Prime Minister, wants things his own way and at any cost. The real reason he can't bear for Parliament to sit and debate is because he knows he does not have the majority to support his disastrous plans to destroy our economy with a no-deal Brexit. What an embarrassment to parliamentary democracy. Well, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister cannot stop MPs doing their jobs. We will be heard and democracy must be respected. Just last week, I was proud that my party signed a declaration alongside MPs across party in Church House, warning the government, and I quote, any attempt to prevent Parliament from sitting, to force through a no-deal Brexit, will be met by strong and widespread democratic resistance. Has the Prime Minister still not listened? Even today, a group of cross-party politicians are in Edinburgh for a full hearing of the Court of Session, attempting to prevent the Prime Minister from proroguing Parliament. My honourable colleague, the member for Edinburgh South West, has already called on the Prime Minister to swear on oath his reason for the prorogation of Parliament. Yes. Will the Prime Minister do so? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think we know the answer to that. We also have a group of experts in constitutional law, human rights and justice, writing in The Times arguing that the recent decision to prorogue Parliament sets a dangerous precedent and furthermore is incompatible with executive accountability to Parliament as prescribed by the Constitution. Has the Prime Minister no shame? No. This no. is a blind power grab showing total arrogance and contempt <laughs> for the electorate. Instead of giving the people a new Prime Minister listening to their wishes, the Prime Minister has robbed the people of all power. Yeah, yeah. What does this mean for this Prime Minister or a future Prime Minister shutting down Parliament on a whim? For us from Scotland, what protection do we have if any UK Prime Minister sought to shut down the Scottish Parliament? Uh, yeah. We need to protect our Parliament from this Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, it is clear that this House is not supportive of the Prime Minister's actions. This emergency debate is crucial as MPs today need to carve a way forward to allow emergency legislation against no deal to be passed. The cross-party bill seeks to ensure that the UK will not leave the EU without a deal unless Parliament consents to such an outcome. It will also require the Prime Minister then to extend Article 50. This is a crucial step to prevent a catastrophic no deal, to protect our economy and our communities. This is how we can come together to avoid a no-deal Brexit and protect the interests of citizens across these islands. And, Mr Speaker, fundamentally to protect not simply the rights of Parliament or parliamentarians, but the rights of the people. The denial of Parliament having its say denies people in Scotland and across the UK their say against a no-deal Brexit. We in the SNP cannot countenance that. I urge members unite to stop a no-deal Brexit to stop this Prime Minister, this dictatorship, and to restore democracy. Tonight, Mr Speaker, it is our turn to take back control. Here, here. Tonight, the Prime Minister is going to be stopped in his tracks. Yep. The Prime Minister has tried to rob the people of their power. Now it's our time to rob him of his. Here.
yeah. order. After we have heard from the father of the house, whom I intend shall speak next, it will be necessary for there to be a time limit on backbench speeches imposed by me in the name of trying to accommodate the maximum number of colleagues in this important debate. Mr Kenneth Clark. Well, Mr Speaker, you are very generous to me, and I, I will try to be extremely short. And uh, Actually, the Honourable Member has just enabled me to be shorter, because I think he made the absolutely key point in the last few moments of his speech when he talked about what really lies behind this bill from the point of view of Parliament and parliamentary democracy. I mean, we all know we're in the middle of an historic crisis, and we all know our duty is to take a decision that will be best for future generations, will do least damage to our political standing in the world and to our economy. But this horrendous debate, which is tearing the country apart, is doing great harm to our political institutions, and particularly Parliament. A large number of the population on either side of the European debate are beginning to hold Parliament almost in contempt, and fanatic leavers are just convinced that it's wicked MPs who are undermining the people's will, and we're solely responsible for the appalling deadlock which we're in. So I'm very glad that, uh, with your help, Mr Speaker, my right honourable friends and others have found this way of enabling the Parliament to assert itself and give its view and face the fundamental challenge from our constitutional point of view, which will determine the political relationship between governments of all colours and parliaments for quite a long time to come. And uh, uh, great respect. Is everybody else going to have a? Uh, I, I love to debate, my honourable friend. I often have. I get longer and longer once I give way. Uh, as the speaker has not put me under the time limit, I'll try to avoid giving way. To be fair to other people, the reason for this motion and the underlying reason for the opposition to it is simply that the government is insisting on pursuing a policy which it knows a majority in Parliament is opposed to. I, I think there is no, no precedent for that that I can think of. Certainly not in modern times. Uh, I've been around for long enough. But I don't think ten years ago, if a government had attempted to implement and put into place a policy which it knew the majority of Parliament were against, it would have created outrage. Parliament has twice voted against leaving with no deal. This Prime Minister has plainly determined that he's put himself in a position where he's got to have no deal. And we all know we have seen the most extraordinary attempts made to avoid this House having opportunities certainly to vote on that, to, to debate on it, to play a role in it. And if Parliament allows itself to be sidelined, then I think the precedent we're creating for future generations and for the behaviour of future governments of all complexions vis-à-vis -vis Parliament is quite horrendous. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the arguments that we've heard about the importance of, of, of limiting these emergency debates. I mean, the, my right honourable friend, the Leader of the House, is, is, is very good at keeping a straight face when he is coming out with arguments that are almost incredible. The, the benefits of trading solely within the WTO, I will leave on one side. Uh, I'm sure the North Koreans thrive under that in every <laughs> conceivable way. Uh, but but the, 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 I think only the North Koreans and the Algerians and I think the Serbians do that. Uh, they, 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 but, but when he starts to say how important it is that this House defends its traditions by making sure that in no circumstances can the House ever get business of its own choice, even in an emergency, I, I really do think, knowing that he's actually a profound parliamentarian and deeply committed to the well-being of this place, his ability to keep a straight face is quite remarkable. But I'm being deterred from the serious point I was making. The prorogation was the, the final, almost charmingly naive attempt uh, to make sure that there wasn't even an opportunity that by mistake there might be something on the order paper that enabled anybody to express their opinion here. Uh, apparently it is suddenly frightfully important uh, that the government's whole new policy package, which seems to be emerging at an extraordinary rate in 
figure terms anyway, uh, had to be put before Parliament before the end of October when we've not really bothered with policy of that kind for a very long time. Uh, and, and it can't be put off the beginning of November, that's plainly really impossible. Uh, and, and most importantly, apparently the reason for the extremely long break is because it's extremely important we do not di distract the public from paying proper attention to the party conferences. <laughs> we, we, we have to be respectful to the Trades Union Congress. We, we cannot distract the television sets of the nation from the Liberal Assembly. Apparently every Conservative MP is dying to go to the Conservative Conference. Uh, 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 and uh, we, we know there are people who will have engagements there. I'm sure the pairing system can cope with that. But the idea that at the moment of such historic crisis, such momentous decisions, that the House can be faced with arguments of that kind, I, I find quite preposterous and very sad. And I think it's quite obvious, given we're being treated in this way, that the House has to seize its own agenda, which is all this vote is about this evening. We make it the fullest opportunity of the next few days, because then the House will be able to make key decisions on what we're legally going to require the government to pursue in the national interest, most importantly, I'd be amazed if the majority doesn't emerge yet again strongly against just leaving with no deal, not really because anybody wants it. About 20 members of the House of Commons, I think, really think it's a good idea to leave with no deal. It's the, other hard, it's the right of my party, otherwise having given up and deciding, get it over with, leave with no deal. It's all the fault of the Germans, the French, and particularly the commissioners, all the fault of Parliament, and uh, have a quick election, wave a union jack, uh, and then we'll sort out the bumps uh, which will come uh, when we've left. That, that the House must stop that and use the opportunity. Tomorrow we'll be debating the merits. We'll go on and on. I'm you know, dying to introduce indeed, more of the arguments. So I've already in this House spoken more than most on Europe, and we all know where we stand on the Leave Remain arguments. The one point of real substance I'd like to address, which at times my frame, first time ever, the Leader of the House was slightly annoying me. He was using what is currently the cliché extreme right-winger argument that anybody who wants to stop a no-deal Brexit is actually reversing the referendum. Now, 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 some are. The reason we can't get a majority for anything here, and we exactly reflect the public, Parliament in its you know, paralysed confusion, I think, entirely reflects the division of the public, where there's no clear majority for anything. But the only thing we have a majority for so far is we're against leaving with no deal. Everything else has so far been blocked by hardline right-wing people who don't want any deal with foreigners, and then people's vote people who won't vote for anything that involves leaving the <laughs> European Union because they want another referendum. I'm afraid they've so far outnumbered the middle. I think more of them should join the middle, because I actually believe that the obvious compromise, greatly to my reluctance, both to bring public opinion together and this House, is a soft Brexit where you keep the present economic ties. Now, then I go back to my right honourable friend, the Leader of the House, who says I'm just defying 17 million people. Well, I haven't defied 17 million people. I've already compromised. I, I, I wasn't in favour of the referendum. I feel very self-justified looking back on it. Uh, I made it clear I didn't vote for it. I made it clear I didn't, wasn't going to change my lifelong opinions because of one day's vote on the simple question on a terribly complicated subject of our national destiny. I vote, voted against invoking Article 50. I was guilty of that. Since then. I accept the way to go proceed is a soft Brexit, leave the political union, stay in those superbly free trade arrangements which British Conservative governments took a leading role in creating. I have voted for Brexit three times, which is a considerable... If this bill gets passed, and if we get onto the substance of the thing, I will vote for Brexit again. 
I have had the privilege of at least once voting alongside the Prime Minister and the Leader of the House in favour of Brexit on terms which they now treat with derision. And I don't want to listen to conspiracy theories about the Irish backstop. I don't think any of the English public sadly take any interest in Irish political affairs. Nine out of ten have no idea what the Irish backstop is. This is an entirely closed little debate. It's a very important one, I can see. I'm strongly in favour of, of the Irish backstop, unless you can replace it with something that's equally, absolutely guaranteed to preserve the Good Friday Agreement. But, but the root of the thing, we do have to deliver to the people. And I think we could get a broad mass of the public together on something that keeps our economic ties together, uh, that attempts, as the EU keeps doing under British leadership, to extend free trade through more and more EU trade agreements, which we took the leading part in pressing for, which now we're about to walk out of, go back to WTO terms all over again, with South Korea and Mercosur and so on, which we're about to do, that must be stopped. I would like to see a bill in which we put more positive steers from this House, because we all know what we're against, no deal. We can't agree on what we're for. Actually, making a legal obligation to seek a customs union making a legal obligation to have some regulatory alignment, I don't think would make the Prime Minister's position more difficult in Europe. They would just wonder why on earth no British leader had asked for that before. But I will leave that till the later proceedings on the bill. Meanwhile, if this Parliament doesn't pass this motion, I think it will be looked back upon with total derision. What sort of a Parliament was it in the middle of this crisis, which said to the government, this new government, this populist government, that's storming away as it is, oh yes, we quite agree with you, we should not be troubled with this. The executive, as we've just been told, has absolute powers. We're only a debating society allowed to comment when we're allowed upon it. Feel free to deliver what you wish by October the 31st, and uh, then we go back to our constituents say it's very important that you have us to represent you in Parliament <laughs> to look after your interests. But as it happens, we've given unbridled powers to Boris for the next few months uh, on the European question. I, therefore, you may gather, Mr Speaker, I'm going to vote for this motion with, with more, you know, more actual passion than I usually go to the debate voting uh, chamber, but lobbies uh, on, on most issues. It's an extremely important evening. Order. I'm afraid a five-minute limit on backbench speeches will now apply. Helen Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to support the motion not only on behalf of the 1.7 million people who have signed a petition on our website against a prorogation of Parliament until we have made decisions on Europe, but also as someone who is profoundly disturbed by the contempt for parliamentary democracy that the Prime Minister has shown in seeking a five-week prorogation of Parliament. And it is profoundly dangerous to our democracy because, as we all know, democracy never disappears with a bang. It disappears by small incremental steps, each one justified as saying that things need to be sorted out, things need to be done, people are blocking the way. And I say that as someone who believes that we should implement the decision of the referendum, but also in a representative democracy that it is for Parliament to decide how that decision should be implemented. And we have struggled with it because we are struggling to reconcile a plebiscite with a representative democracy. That struggle has not been made any easier by the misleading statements made during that referendum that we would get the easiest trade deal ever, and so on. And Brexit cannot be accomplished, as the Prime Minister seeks to tell us, by a few slogans from a self-help book and a rousing chorus of always look on the bright side of life. It is complicated, and Parliament has to deal with those complications. I have no doubt that the Prime Minister sees himself as a Democrat. 
I'm told he keeps a bust of Pericles in Downing Street. I don't know whether he chose Pericles because his foreign policy alienated most of the other Greek states or because he prorogued the Athenian assembly. But while he speaks as a, he sees himself as a democrat, he speaks like a demagogue. Absolutely. He has called parliamentarians collaborators with Europe in seeking to block no deal. He uses the language of a war. There are far too many people here trying to relive a war in which they were not only too young to take part, but are too young even to remember. And that demeans the sacrifices of those who fought in that war. Our job is to take the difficult decisions. And one of the things we must do, it seems to me, is to block a no-deal Brexit, which would be disastrous for this country, disastrous for most of our constituents, and it damage not just this generation, but generations to come. And where are all the members of the Cabinet who told us that prorogation would be an affront to parliamentary democracy? Mad! A ridiculous suggestion. Silent as the grave. And if cabinet government no longer exists, and it seems not to exist, then it is for parliament to ensure that the government is properly scrutinised. I know it will be difficult for many on the opposition benches tonight. Uh, sorry, on the government benches tonight. They have been threatened with the loss of the whip and the loss of their jobs. Many will have to break the bonds of loyalty to their own party, which all of us have. But I beg them tonight to act not in their own interests or in the interests of the party, but in the interests of the country. They should remember what Clem Attlee once said. If you begin to view yourself as only responsible to a political party, you are halfway to a dictatorship. The country expects us tonight to act in the national interest, and it is vital that we do so. Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I've heard an enormous amount over the last few weeks about the way in which this government is undermining democracy, undermining our sovereignty. I've just heard the, my right honourable friend, the member for Rushcliffe, uh, rubbishing a lot of the arguments that the government uh, has been putting forward over the last few weeks. But I, I would simply like to say this. Um, the reality is that there are those in this House, however much they like to dress it up, and I said this on the second reading, I think, of the withdrawal bill itself, that actually they never accepted the idea that we should leave the European Union with or without a deal. They just don't want to leave. I understand that, and I actually pay some tribute to some of those who have been entirely consistent about these arguments, and in particular my right honourable friend, the member for Rushcliffe, and he knows I, I genuinely feel that. But having said that, I'm afraid that the burden of the argument which I've heard addressed by the member for West Dorset, for example, I simply cannot accept under any circumstances. This House, as I said in an intervention with the Leader of the House, actually made a decision, and it made a decision on the Referendum Act itself, a sovereign act of Parliament, which deliberately gave to the British people the right to make the decision and not this House. What also happened under the Lisbon Treaty enactment, which was passed in 2008, was that under our domestic law, we agreed that we would allow the Article 50 process to, to, to commence. And it said that within two years, if there was no decision, then we would leave on exit day, as expressed ultimately in the other Act of Parliament, Withdrawal Act, Section 1 of which said that the repeal of the 72 Act would take place on exit day. Now, it is impossible, in my judgment, to argue that this debate and all the, in my opinion, ripping up of conventions and all the things that my right honourable friend said, which I entirely agree with, about this improper procedure for the purposes of achieving an objective can really just be washed away on the grounds that somehow or other there is an argument about our not having any possibility of leaving without a deal. 
I would simply say this, Mr Speaker, if I may. Um, this is certainly, as the Honourable Member for Rushcliff said, a matter of unbelievably important historic significance. We came into the European Union in 1972 on the basis of a white paper, and I got out that white paper only today, and it quite clearly states that we will never give up the veto. Uh, we would never do so. And furthermore, not only would we never give up the veto, but in addition to that, and that was the basis on which we came into the European Communities Act 972, which is still the governing enactment. And furthermore, it went on to say that, that to do so would endanger the very fabric of the community. What, that is why so many people all over the whole of Europe are voting with their feet against the system. Look at what's going on in Italy at the moment, and in Greece, and in many other countries. So why would anybody actually want to remain in this European Union? It's autocratic. It's dominated by one country in particular and by the French as well. The bottom line is it is not a, it is not a system which allows us to govern ourselves. And I would simply say this, Mr Speaker, it is, it is clear that we, the government that takes place under the Council of Ministers is a system which enables us to be governed by 27 other member states. The withdrawal agreement, which was never signed, would allow us to be kept in that, in that uh, system of vassalage. Governed by other 20, another 27 member states, it is an unacceptable system. And yet, if we were to leave, albeit I'd prefer to have a deal, but with no deal, I'd simply say this. We'll be able to trade globally on our own terms. We would no longer be constrained by the deficit which we run with the European Union. We would be able to govern ourselves, and we would also ensure that we retain Northern Ireland as part of our constitutional status. These are matters which transcend the arguments that are being pushed around in this House today. These are the simple questions of principle. These are the questions which we need to address. We must be allowed, as we have for centuries, to govern ourselves until we came into the European Community. The competences have been so grossly extended that we do not govern ourselves, and if we stay in this European Union, we will never be able to do so. I am against this motion, and I hope that the House will vote against it. Thank you. Mr Nicholas Edward Coleridge-Bowles. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to support the motion in the name of my friend, the Right Honourable Member for Dorset West. On the morning of the 7th of February 2017, I woke up in an isolation room at King's College Hospital where I was receiving chemotherapy. My blood counts were rock bottom and the chances of an infection high. Weak as a kitten, I got dressed. My friend and parliamentary neighbour, the Brexit Secretary, who was then a government whip, met me at the entrance to the ward with a hospital porter and a wheelchair. He took me out to the chief whip's car and we were driven to Parliament so that I could vote for the Article 50 Bill. Since that moment, I have done everything in my power to deliver Brexit with a deal that protects jobs and livelihoods, that preserves our national unity and our international standing. I voted for the former Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement on three separate occasions while the current Prime Minister, Foreign Secretary and Leader of the House were all breaking the Conservative whip and voting with the Leader of the Opposition. I worked with colleagues across the House to promote an alternative Brexit deal, Common Market 2.0, and secured the support of Labour, the SNP and Plaid Cymru for a plan that would have taken us out of the European Union's political arrangements but kept us in the single market. I am ready to vote for a revised withdrawal agreement if the Prime Minister can secure changes through a negotiation with the EU. 
I still believe, like many honourable members from the Labour benches and elsewhere in this House, I still believe we need to deliver what a majority of my constituents and a majority of the British people voted for in the referendum of 2016. What I will not do is allow a no deal Brexit. It would devastate sheep farmers in my constituency. It would be a hammer blow for automotive businesses in my constituency and across the country. It would put our union with Scotland and Northern Ireland in jeopardy. And it would be the single most protectionist step taken by any democratic country since the Great Depression, raising tariffs and trade barriers between us and our largest market. Taking this stand cost me the support of my local party and in April led me to leave the Conservative Party. But I have no regrets. I can look people in the eye, knowing that I have done what I believe to be right and put the interests of the country before my own comfort or career. How many members of the Cabinet can say the same? Mr Speaker, at the moment I am the only independent progressive Conservative in Parliament. (laughs) To those brave souls on the Conservative benches who face expulsion from the party for voting for the motion today, I say this. Your country needs you. Do what you know to be right. Join me on these benches and together let us build a new force in British politics and a true home in Parliament for those who believe in one nation. Dr Liam Fox. Uh, Thank you Mr Speaker and uh, may I commend you for ensuring that new backbenchers are able to take part in the debate at such an (laughs) early stage. Um, I begin by echoing the uh, objections raised by the Leader of the House on constitutional grounds to this motion. I believe that denying the executive the right to uniquely institute legislation is fraught with danger. And I think that many of the debates and some of the changes that we've seen in Parliament in recent times show the fragility of a system that is based on convention and whether we want to or not is propelling us down the route towards a written constitution, which is something none of us should want to do without taking due care and attention. But my main objection, Mr Speaker, is political. Now, the Honourable Lady, who is no longer in her place, the member for Warrington North, raised the tension that we have effectively between a public who voted to leave the European Union and a parliament which, let's face it, if it had its way freely, would want to remain in the European Union. Now, I don't doubt for a moment the legitimacy, the legal legitimacy, of a sovereign parliament to make laws as it sees fit. What I do doubt is the moral legitimacy of a parliament that called a referendum, promised to honour the result of that referendum, and then, three years later, still has not done so. Now, my right honourable friend, uh, the member for Dorset West, said that we've all made our own different judgments. Some have voted for a deal unenthusiastically. I have to say that I number myself among those who had strong reservations but felt it was the best way to move forward. Some have voted against the deal because they want there to be no deal as the outcome. And some have voted against the deal because they want there to be no Brexit at all. And it's that latter group that I just want to address one or two. Uh, questions because this is about the political reputation of Parliament itself. Those who have had a premeditated campaign to try to thwart the Brexit result itself, hiding behind the arguments that it's just the deal that they are opposed to, do themselves, Parliament and politics, no credit at all. And that position is worsened if they stood at the general election on a manifesto that explicitly said they would honour the result of the referendum, but they themselves had absolutely no intention of doing so. That, I think, 
will result in the contempt of voters. And for those particular members who have taken that path, I look forward to their meeting with their voters when we get to the next general election, whenever that comes. I am concerned, Mr Speaker, about where this places us in EU negotiations. To be successful in a negotiation, both sides have to re regard it as providing mutual self-interest. This does not do this. Pro this process will cast us in the role of supplicants, taking control not back to this House, but to the European Union negotiators. That is not in our national interest. We, in this political bubble, very often argue about the process and the minutiae and fail to see the big picture, which is what our voters are looking at. We didn't ask for an opinion from voters. We asked for an instruction. We said we would honour it, and we are honour-bound to do so. And I urge colleagues not to cast their vote tonight with the coalition of chaos, for that will be the result. Delay will follow delay. It is time, one way or another, to deliver Brexit. And I make one further point. One of our senior French colleagues said to me, Liam, you need to leave the European Union following your referendum. A senior <coughs> pro-European politician, he said, the problems of political fragmentation in France began when we did not honour the result of the referendum on the European Constitution. It was the beginning of the end of the major parties and the beginning of the rise of the political fringe. Mr Speaker, I fear that if we go down the path that is being suggested tonight, we will be opening up a chasm of distrust between Parliament and the British people. It is something that will play only into the hands of the political yeah, yeah. fringes, and that is something we will all come to regret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, I have to say it's a pleasure, of course, to follow the Right Honourable Member for North Somerset, but at a time when our country should be coming together to find a way through this terrible crisis which we are in, the biggest crisis since the Second World War. It is no longer acceptable, if I may say, to continue to seek to divide. We have to bring people back together. And one of the ways to do that is not to impart on people views and motives which are simply not true. Now, the Right Honourable Member, my dear friend for Rushcliffe, I don't think he and I disagree, Mr Speaker, on anything, but we do agree, disagree on Brexit because, as he's rightly pointed out, and my honourable friend, the member for um, Grantham and Stamford, Stamford and Grantham pointed out, they are now, and it's this, I'm not using this in any derogatory sense, but they are, of course, Brexiteers. On three occasions, as they perfectly properly say, they have voted for us to leave the European Union. And the reason that I did not join them in the lobbies, and I really take grave exception to this, is not because I want to stop Brexit, and that will upset many millions of people in this country, some of whom have come on the People's Vote marches and, and go to the rallies and so on and so forth. That will, that will disappoint them because they want us to stop Brexit. But I have always taken the view that it is not my role, having voted for the referendum, the triggering of Article 50, the withdrawal agreement, it's not for me to stop Brexit. And I would have voted for the former Prime Minister's deal if it went back to the British people and they were entitled, as I believe they are, to have their final say now that we know what Brexit looks like. And I do have to chide the Right Honourable Member for North Somerset, the reason why so many people, of my view, are so fed up is because Right Honourable learned other members, like him, said this would be the easiest deal that this country has ever done, in fact, in the history of all deals. That's what we were told. And in fact, the withdrawal agreement was everything but a deal. It was a blind Brexit. That's why so many of us didn't vote for it, because we didn't get the promised deal <coughs> that we were told we would have. And of course, the second reason that we didn't vote for it, certainly in my case, and I suspect amongst most of us that chose not to vote for the former Prime Minister's deal is because on the government's own assessments it would have made my constituents poorer. It would have reduced the economic prospects of my constituents and indeed, most importantly, the young people, the young people who will bear the brunt of Brexit more than anybody. And I did not come to this place 
positively to vote in the full knowledge that it would make my constituents' jobs less uh, valuable. They would make them risky. And I make no bones about this. I'm quite happy and willing to lose my job, but I'm damned if I'm going to see the jobs of my constituents and the life chances of their children and grandchildren reduced. And the final thing, Mr Speaker, I would say, because I don't want to repeat all the excellent words about why no deal is so bad for our con country, bad for jobs, bad for peace and trade in, in Northern Ireland, bad for our economy. I just want to pay tribute to dear friends um, on, with whom I sat on those benches as a member of the Conservative Party. <coughs> Today marks a very bleak and, I believe, momentous day of the Conservative Party. So what you are seeing, Mr Speaker, is a group of fine parliamentarians, yeah, yeah, yeah. excellent members of Parliament, who have been bullied and blackmailed in a way that members of the Cabinet, who repeatedly and with long histories of defying three-line whips, notwithstanding that, this bunch of honourable people, most of whom, and I've looked and checked the list, most of the Conservatives who've signed this motion have voted three times for Brexit. And they found themselves today in the most disgraceful of situations, in effect bullied and blackmailed, putting their political careers to an end to do the right thing by our country. And as I think my honourable friend said, Stanford and Grantham, this is about our country. And it's also about your own respect. It's whether you can look yourself in the mirror in the morning and not be ashamed of what looks back at you. And that moment when your children ask you and your grandchildren, how on earth did you stand by and let this disaster of a no deal happen? We at least will say we did the right thing. We put our country and not our careers first. Yeah. Yeah, Mr Dominic Green. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow uh, my right the right honourable lady. And if I may say to uh, my right honourable friend, the member for North Somerset, I also listened carefully to what he had to say, because he made one important point about, which has come up about the will of the people. It's absolutely right that most of us in this House voted to trigger Article 50. We did that out of respect for the result of the referendum, even if we didn't like it. But three and a half years down the track, it's perfectly obvious to many of us that this country is going to a very bad outcome. And the longer the period that passes from the referendum, the more unclear it is, in truth, what the will of the people is. We have no idea. And that's why I've always been willing to see a deal go through, but I want it to go back to the public. Because I am left with a compelling sense that we are actually taking people to a destination they don't want at all. What has happened is, unfortunately, a section of my party has become hijacked by a narrow sector of those who voted to leave and who are simply using the will of the people as an instrument of potential tyranny towards yeah, yeah. any of those who yeah, disagree yeah. with yeah, them. Yeah. As I can see in the email stream, I routinely get. And I'm afraid fuelled now by the words of the Prime Minister, and indeed I have to say, I regret to have to say this, but I will, by the words of the Leader of the House uh, today. And it was fascinating to listen to the Leader of the House. I'd always imagined that he had marketed himself in politics as an individual who, respect, who, who formed part of the grandest tradition of old-fashioned conservatism. Yeah, yeah. And so I was rather surprised when I heard him refer to one of his objections why this House should do its duty, that it would interfere with the great set pieces that followed a, a state opening of Parliament. Of course, as a Conservative, I love the great set pieces of our Constitution. But I don't think in a time of national emergency my constituents in Beaconsfield would have much regard for me for saying that the great set pieces had to come before my doing my duty. I also, I have to say to him, with regret, it's the first time I've heard him at the dispatch box, that I regretted his rather cheap sarcasm at the expense of uh, my right honourable friend, the member for West Dorset, and I just gently point out he has more months of experience of high office than my right honourable friend uh, has of days in his job. 
And the truth is that the government has decided to pursue a ruthless policy of trying to shut down all debate, debate of the most legitimate kind about the future of our country and its well-being, and in doing so, the unconstitutional acts come wholly from the government. I disagree totally with my right honourable friend, the Leader of the House, when he says that uh, it's uh, in some way this House is acting unconstitutionally in what it does. Our constitution is adaptable, and I'm afraid it's having to adapt to the reality that the government doesn't have a majority and hasn't had one for some time. And that is just one of those things which happens, and it's doing it actually in a fairly reasonable fashion. Although it would be better if we listened politely to each other and stopped trying to beat each other over the head, as I detect is the practice which the government is now adopting. Yeah. <coughs> and finally, I will say this. Um, obviously, I believe that this motion is entirely desirable, entirely in keeping with the House's proper traditions, and is something which should be passed and the bill that follows it so that the evils of a no-deal Brexit are avoided because I believe passionately that evil will follow. But I was struck by my uh, right honourable friend, the Leader of the House, who suddenly referred to a man for all seasons, I think because Sir Thomas More is one of his heroes. He will recollect that Sir Thomas said uh, when uh, told that uh, opposition to the King would mean death, well, these are but devices to frighten children. So I'm afraid if he thinks that the device of withdrawing the whip this evening is going to change my mind or that of my honourable and right honourable friends, he has got another thing coming yeah. because it will be treated with the contempt it deserves. The time limit is now reduced to four minutes. Tommy Shepherd. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Myself and my party have been consistent over the last four years in voting against this country leaving the European Union. And we do that for many reasons, but most of all because that is what the people who elected us to speak for them in this place want. Scotland did not vote for this, and Scotland does not <coughs> want this. But we have never in these debates suggested that the result of the 2016 Brexit referendum should be ignored, set aside or overturned by this Parliament. What we have said is it is the legitimate and proper role of an elected Parliament to consider the consequences of this course of action, and if in our judgment we believe those consequences to be sufficiently dire, <coughs> then we should allow the opportunity for the people of the country to reconsider the decision they took in 2016 in full knowledge of the facts and knowledge that we now have available. And what is at risk now is the right of this Parliament to exercise that degree of judgment. It is a shame in many ways that we have to move this motion tonight and that we have to pass emergency legislation tomorrow. It ought to be the other way around. A government, particularly a minority government, ought to be coming to this chamber, trying to find consensus, trying to explain itself, trying to get us behind it. <coughs> but instead, that is not happening. And the reason why so many people find it necessary to do what we are going to do tonight is simply because we have lost faith in this government. Yeah. Not only has the government today, in a moment, not only has the government today lost its majority, but it has also lost the trust of this House. Yeah. We do not believe the Prime Minister when he says he is trying to get a deal. We see no evidence of this whatsoever. Yeah. And we do not believe the Prime Minister when he says he respects parliamentary democracy because he is trying to shut down <coughs> the ability of this House to debate his actions and their consequences. I'll take the intervention. I thank the Honourable Friend, uh, the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. He was talking about compromise. We had an opportunity to compromise back in spring, one on the customs union. We only left by three votes. We lost by three votes in that customs union vote. I would ask where were he and his SNP colleagues then when it was SNP policy on single market and customs union where he could have had a compromise and avoid this. This isn't about time, this is about compromise. Show us you're willing to do it. No, no. The Honourable Member is wrong because the seeds of this problem were sown long before that. They were sown when a right-wing Conservative government 
decided to seize on the result of the referendum and use that narrow majority and interpret it for its own ends to restructure this country and its international relationships and its economy. And even now, even now we see a situation where the government is committed to pursuing the hardest of Brexits, crashing out without a deal uh, if, if it deems that necessary, and it, you actually even believe that that is the preferred course of action. And it knows not only is there no majority in this House for that course of action, there is no majority in the country either for that course of action. Now that brings me to the topic of the election, which is an associated matter here, because there have been suggestions that are we to do this, then the Prime Minister will immediately throw his toys out of the pram and go to the country and demand a general election. And we have already had an echo of the gross populism from the Leader of the House that may well come to be reflected in that campaign, something which I think does his character no great service, to be honest. But if that is the election is going to come, then let us be quite clear. We need to have an election before this country crashes out of the European Union without a deal. So we're ready for an election. Bring it on, but either have it before the 31st of October or extend that deadline of the 31st of October so that we can make a decision as a people and elect a parliament before this fait accompli is presented to them. That would be the legitimate thing to do. And I would ask the Prime Minister that if he really wants to have an election, then don't engage in these procedural shenanigans and this duplicity in trying to game the parliament. Put the proposal for a no-deal Brexit <coughs> to the electorate. Put that to the electorate, explain the consequences, and see if that is what they vote for. And when that happens, I will relish the prospect to contest that election, because we shall not only be contesting that election in order to prevent and stop Brexit and have a reconsideration of that strategy, but we shall also be explaining to the people of Scotland that this is their chance to consider having a different course of action than the one which they have been allowed, uh, led down by the current Prime Minister. And I am confident that when we go to the people of Scotland, so many more than ever before will not understand the attractiveness of having political independence over their own affairs and being able to control their own destiny and establish their own relationships with the rest of the countries in Britain, in Europe and the world. And that is what is coming down the track. I warn the government to be aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I would put it to the Honourable Gentleman for Edinburgh East. In fact, that very question that he wants put to the British people again is the question that was put on the ballot paper in the 2016 referendum, and the Prime Minister himself made it clear in debates on television that if uh, the country votes leave, this, question, this decision would be implemented, Article 50 would be invoked, and after two years, then we're out, out of the single market, out of the customs union. That is what he said. So I don't see any necessity to run the thing again. I, I merely rise, Mr Speaker, on the occasion of this debate. Uh, to observe that um, what some people, including yourself, call a constitutional outrage, and it's a little novel for the Speaker to enter into the debate uh, quite so openly in that way, but there we are. That's another novelty uh, taking place in our Constitution. Um, uh, other people re refer to it as a perfectly normal decision. Um, well, of course, in truth, it is neither, but the, uh, this controversy does reflect the evolving and changing nature of the relationship between Parliament, government and people. That is a permanent evolution in our constituency. And I would say there are two measures in particular that have led to a very substantial sea change in the relationship between Parliament and government. The first is the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, um, which was sold to a, perhaps a rather unsuspecting House as a means of limiting executive power. But in the event of a statutory no confidence vote, the Act is silent on what happens afterwards, except for the 14 day period. The Prime Minister may be no longer able to call a general election, but he's no longer obliged to resign either, and um, at least not for 14 days. This has the effect of strengthening the incumbency of a sitting Prime Minister. Of course, that's exactly what it was intended to do. It was intended to cement the coalition in place, uh, but that has uh, given us a uh, a position where the House is left with the option to wound rather than to kill governments. Um, and uh, I don't think that has improved the accountability of governments to Parliament in any way at all. And the second uh, thing 
that has happened causing this sea change is the increase in the frequency of the use of referendums. This has consequences too, as many warned, not for the sovereignty of Parliament, but as my right honourable friend, the member for uh, um, Somerset um, North uh, said, this has a consequence for, for legitimacy, because we now have, in our constitution, we have competing legitimacies. And what we are hearing is a very bitter dispute about whether the representative nature of our democracy is a superior legitimacy to the direct... I'm not giving way. OK, well, I will give way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very grateful for my honourable friend giving way. Does he recall during the Vote Leave campaign that it was said that this Parliament and MPs in this Parliament would decide which Brexit model, whether it was Norway, Switzerland, uh, would apply, and that was part of the taking back control. So the 17.4 million people weren't speaking with a single voice because they believed there was a menu of options. Well, I, I think also there was a menu of options available to those who voted Remain, and I know many people who voted Remain who wish we'd just get on and leave now. Um, the, but the, I, I, don't think, I don't think the Honourable Lady makes a, a valid point, or, or indeed underlines, undermines the fundamental point that we now have a constitution in which there are competing legitimacies, um, and some people are resting the authority of their argument on the representative mandate, and some, the government in particular, on the popular vote. Um, and it is at least as much a constitutional outrage that three years after the referendum we're still in the European Union um, and, yeah. and the, the, the bill proposed tomorrow, the bill to propose for tomorrow, should be proposing to hand the question of how we leave not back to this House, but back to the European Union to decide. Um, uh, uh, no, it's absolutely true because that's what um, that's what exactly what um, our, um, uh, 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 section three two of the draft bill actually says. So the bitterness, the bitterness to, of tonight's exchanges reflects the breakdown of our shared understanding about which is legitimate, the representative or the direct mandate. And now we have a constitution containing, containing these uh, competing ideas of legitimacy. Unless we are to abandon referendums, then this House should be ready to implement popular decisions it does not like, and it has shown some reluctance to do so. And if we refuse to do so, I agree again with my right honourable friend for North Somerset. Uh, that will have consequences for the credibility of Parliament in the eyes of our electors. And we will see the revival of alternative political parties. And I fear this House is taking politics in that direction. The sovereignty of Parliament is not at risk, but our demo democratic legitimacy certainly is. Yeah. Uh, Mr Gordon Marsden. So, Mr Speaker, it has come to this tonight that this new Prime Minister and his ministers, not just their competence but also their good faith, has been so destroyed across this House that this radical but necessary step to, prevent, to preserve parliamentary democracy and our futures has been taken. And anyone who has heard either the Honourable Gentleman, the, the, the Leader of the House, or indeed uh, the very uh, the, the, the way in which the Brexit minister rattled away to Mary Pace will recall those old words. The louder they protested their honour, the faster we counted the spoons. Because the truth of the matter is that this no deal would drive us into the arms of Donald Trump on the NHS. This no deal would be no good for the, my, the people in my constituency who are now having unemployment twice the national average, and this no deal would be no good for the people uh, who need the desperate medical issues that the Honourable Lady uh, the S from the SNP talked about earlier. And the list of warnings about no deal Brexit grow longer. Crises about supplies and prices of fresh food, essential medicines, chaos on the road, ports after Halloween. All warnings, not from Marxists or from Trotskyists or left-wingers, but from such radical organisations as the British Retail Consortium and the British Road Hauliers. But you know, this isn't just about Brexit anymore, or even whether people voted for leave or remain. It's about our future as a progressive democracy in the United Kingdom. And 
I think that we really have to take that into account. But we also have to take into account the situation of individual constituents. My constituents, the man who wrote to me and said, my father is rather ill these days and relies on a variety of medication. I'm concerned what the impact of a no deal would have on the supply of this medication. Yes. And we've heard from those who have no axe to grind that that is absolutely the case. Um, I've had a letter, as many of us will have had, from ordinary constituents. An ordinary constituent says, please can you help over this issue with no deal Brexit? Our NHS is so important to us, there's food on our plates, it's hard to survive as it is. I cut back on power and food and power and have no holidays. Please sort this out. That's an ordinary constituent, not engaged with the finer constitutional points that the Leader of the House manages to trim on the sixpence but with the everyday bread and butter of daily living in a town like many others in the north of England where people feel left behind and vulnerable and where to satisfy the interests of a small group of cronies round the Prime Minister this government is trying to stamp down on everything that's said. There is no evidence, not even a sniff, of them having presented any proposals to the EU. The Prime Minister fancies himself as a classicist. Well, what he's been doing is in the, in, the, in the tradition of the prescriptions of ancient Rome and the way in which he has treated his own backbenchers. The Prime Minister also fashions himself as an admirer of Churchill. Well, he should remember that Churchill told us all that the first duty of a member is to do what he thinks is his faithful and disinterested judgment to the honour and the safety of this Britain. And that's what patriotism is about. That's what real patriotism is about. And the way in which this Prime Minister has disgracefully used the uh, prorogation process blunts the interests of this House blunts the interests of the British people. They are not the attributes of a British <coughs> Prime Minister. They're the uh, I would say they were the attributes of a tin pot uh, despot or autocrat, except that this Prime Minister might think it flattered him. No, what he is is a petulant man child unable to get his way with this House, and that is why he is trying to shut down. That is why he's trying to shut down debate with this prorogation, and that is why we should support this motion tonight. Sam Batch. Mr Speaker, this Parliament is at the very heart of our national story and our shared history. It's what the Prime Minister's great idol, Winston Churchill, called the cockpit of the nation. To seek to bar the door to that cockpit as the nation flies into one of the biggest storms, constitutional storms, in its history is an unsettling thing for a government to do. It may not be illegal or unconstitutional, but it's not how a strong government would conduct itself, nor a responsible one. Europhobic conspiracists occasionally claim that the EU wants to reduce the House of Commons to a mere council chamber. I'm afraid if the government achieves its aims this week, it will have gone further. It will have reduced us from a proud, sovereign parliament to a mere debating club, to be dismissed when it becomes inconvenient. If the government succeeds this week, what is to stop the Prime Minister doing it again in the future? What is to stop the Leader of the Opposition, should he come to power? And I hope that never comes to pass. Precedent matters and so does motive. The government's claim that this is to enable it to put forward new domestic legislation is clearly nonsense, a fig leaf to hide its attempt to evade accountability. This House has stood as the defender of our liberties for centuries. The historian Robert Saunders put it best. The UK government shines with a borrowed light, a light that comes solely from the consent of our elected representatives. Mm -hmm. Shut that down and our democracy is plunged into darkness. Yes. It has indeed been plunged into darkness. We are in darkness. And it's claimed that this prorogation is a normal prorogation. It isn't. This, par this parliament would have accepted, expected to have a motion put before it, a recess motion put before it, by the Leader of the House that would have asked this Parliament to agree to the party conference recess. That motion has never been put to us. We have never, as Members of Parliament, been asked to agree 
the parliamentary recess, and it is highly likely that we would not have done, given the scale of the crisis that faces our country at the moment. The Leader of the House claims to speak for 17.4 million people. Well, I want to tell him about a constituent of mine on the train. Uh, I, I was on the train going back to my constituency when a constituent approached me and said, you're my MP. He said, I voted for leave because I wanted to give David Cameron a kicking. I didn't really think it would go through. Please, now, do something to change that. I have voted three times for the withdrawal agreement. Three times I have seen members of my party, my party vote that agreement down when their Conservative Prime Minister told them it complied with our manifesto commitment to an orderly exit. And yet they defied that. And I have a constituent that has written uh, this evening to me to say that the Leader of the House has rebelled against uh, a Conservative-led government more than 100 times, and he has been rewarded with a place on the front bench. And yet the MP for South West Hertfordshire, who has never voted against the uh, government, is going to be expelled from the party. What times we live in, I will be voting for this motion. Um, I will not be uh, supporting this uh, motion tonight, as I did not the last time that Parliament tried to change the way we constitutionally work. Uh, we were told then, of course, that it was a one-off. Uh, we are now in our second or third one-offs. And of course, if this goes through tonight, uh, tomorrow we will be debating a bill uh, which, if we actually look at it in detail already, and I know we'll have that debate tomorrow, is making it very, very clear uh, that, that it is going to give even more power to the European Union in terms of how long we should have any kind of extension. And I was very concerned today, and I know it's only a rumour, but rumours usually are there's some truth in them, that actually some of the people who drafted this uh, motion for the bill tomorrow, this bill tomorrow, actually took advice from EU legal lawyers. Now, if that actually happened, I think that is quite shocking. But I know there will be people in this House who think there's nothing wrong with that, and that actually they want to be as close as possible to the European Union, and there will be nothing wrong in taking advice from them. I believe that the bill tomorrow, if this motion was passed tonight, would be a bill which would be actually humiliating this Parliament. And you know, we heard a lot about constitutional outrage about what was happening uh, when the announcement was made about the Queen's speech. And I genuinely believe that those four or five extra days that have been added to a recess that we all knew about just before the House lifted, that if people had felt strongly about, they could have moved and got that discussion then. Those five or four or five extra days, that is much, much less of a constitutional outrage than what we're setting a precedent for today to actually take away powers from government. And our side will be in government someday. Perhaps a general election is coming. They will be in that same position. And I do think people should be being very, very careful. What we're saying today to people is, what is the point of voting? They voted to leave. Leave won. There was nothing on the ballot paper that said, as many people have said, we didn't vote for a no, with a no deal. But there was also nothing on that ballot paper that said that we wanted to have be half in or half out, that we wanted uh, 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 to pay 39 billion, that we wanted to do all those things that were in the withdrawal agreement. We voted to leave. People voted to leave, and the reality is not 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 everybody in this house who votes tonight. I know many of them are remainers who have accepted the result. But the reality is that on my side in particular, there are many, many of my colleagues who actually want to stop Brexit. And they have seen now using no deal as almost synonymous with stopping Brexit. And that is what is the real truth about what's going on. Now, the uh, right honourable member for Rushcliffe, who has been honest from the beginning, is not in his seat now, said tonight about tearing the country apart. Well, what on earth is another extension going to do? 
other than tear the country even more apart? What on earth is an, are we going to gain by another extension that we haven't already been able to, to achieve in the last two and a half years? What will it actually achieve? And what we are doing tonight, if we vote for this, is sending a signal to all those people to leave, who voted to leave that we know best, that we are being arrogant, that we know best about how the future outside the European Union will work. And I believe that that is going to come home right to hit through, particularly to my party, but to the Conservative Party as well, when we get that general election. And I would say that any Labour Party member who didn't vote for a general election would be ab looking absolutely ridiculous. Bring an election on and let the people show what they really want. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to uh, follow the Honourable Lady. I rise to oppose this motion, and I'd like to do so by considering what it is that it sets out to achieve. This motion does not prevent no deal. It simply requires the Prime Minister, if a deal is not agreed, to ask for an extension and to accept it. That does not avoid no deal. It simply pushes further away the point at which we in this House have to make a decision. And the people we represent are expecting us to make a decision. It's what we're here for. It's what they are crying out for us to do. And I have to say to honourable members on all sides of this House, you cannot legislate no deal away. You can only vote for a deal or revoke Article 50. If revoke is what is sought, and I know some honourable members would favour that, then have that debate, say so, and those who voted as part of that overwhelming majority for the referendum, and then to trigger Article 50, can explain why they have changed their minds. But the question of revocation has been tried in the indicative votes and was heavily defeated. I venture to say that there is no majority for revocation in this House. And so all that this procedure seeks to do is to delay, to kick the can further down the road in the hope that something will turn up. There is, in essence, no plan proposed here. In contrast, what the Government is doing is pursuing a strategy based upon the only thing that has commanded a majority in this House, the Brady Amendment, alternative arrangements to replace the backstop. And it will be said that the EU has no intention of doing so. But the EU is watching and is waiting to see what we do here. It has no incentive to move for as long as it thinks that Parliament will destroy the government's negotiating position or cancel Brexit altogether. If we in this House declare in advance that we must come to an agreement, then the government's negotiating position is destroyed and the EU will never have an incentive to move. So it is therefore the case that this whole scheme, rather than banishing no deal, makes it impossible to achieve one, and in so doing puts off the day of reckoning even further. But it cannot be avoided forever. There's only one way to avoid no, to avoid no deal and to achieve a deal. That way to achieve that deal, paradoxically, is to be ready and willing to leave without one. Only if we are clear about that does the Prime Minister stand a chance. I accept that that readiness causes disquiet amongst so many of my friends tonight. But to all those friends who, like me, want to see a deal, I would urge them to come with us and give the Prime Minister the unequivocal backing that he needs, because that is the only path to the deal that we all want to see. To vote against the Government tonight is not to vote against no deal. To vote against the Government tonight is to vote against even the possibility of a deal, against the chance of a deal, even the glimmer of a deal. The motion and the bill it foreshadows achieves nothing more than delay, a delay that in turn achieves nothing more than to sow more division and discord, that division and discord that is doing such damage to our country's social fabric. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker.
Speaker, I am very pleased to speak in favour of this motion, which would enable us to pass a bill tomorrow to prevent our crashing out of the EU with no deal at the end of October. And let us just remember why we are at this point. This discussion is happening now because the Prime Minister is running scared of democracy. A Prime Minister who knows his reckless no-deal Brexit will never get the support of this House. But instead of having the courage to make his case here, to putting himself to scrutiny, instead of that, Parliament is going to be suspended, brushed aside as an inconvenience to an executive that is frankly lurching out of control. Well, I am proud that so many brave colleagues inside this House and so many of the public outside it are saying so loudly and clearly that they will not stand for this Prime Minister's blatant power grab, that they will not stand for a no-deal Brexit being rammed through this House, and that they will stand up to make sure that this legislature does what it is meant to do, which is to hold this executive, this feral, out-of-control executive, to account. Now, there's been a lot of talk about democracy tonight, and the Leader of the House, who I have to say, with his body language throughout this evening, has been so contemptuous of this House sit, and of the people. Up, and for the benefit of Hansard, the Leader of the House has been spread across around three seats, lying out uh, as if that was something very boring for him to listen to tonight. Well, can I just say to him, when he has been lecturing us about democracy, we will have none of it, because... Yeah, this yeah. government has no mandate for the vicious form of Brexit it is pursuing. It was never on the ballot paper. More than that, the right honourable member for Surrey Heath said as recently as March, and I quote, we did not vote to leave without a deal. That wasn't the message of the campaign I helped to lead. So let's hear no more of this posturing that somehow people on that side of the House from the government are standing up for the people and we are not. Those of us on this side, and particularly those of us who have been arguing for a people's vote from the very start, are precisely the ones who are standing up for the people and want their voices to be heard in this debate. Now, time is short and I want to make two more very quick points. The first is that in all of this debate about process and procedure, we are in danger of forgetting what a no deal actually means for the people of this country. What it means, as we know from Operation Yellowhammer, is shortages of food and fuel. It means people unable to get their life-saving medicines. It also means a nightmare for people in Northern Ireland. I pay tribute to the uh, Honourable Member for North Down, who has made yeah, that yeah. case so many times. How dare we, in this chamber, think that we're going to rip up the Good Friday Agreement and think that it's nothing to be concerned about? There is everything to be concerned about that. But I also want to say a word as well about the three million, those people who's made their lives here in this country, expecting that their contribution would be valued, instead of which now they are in an intolerable limbo, not knowing whether their rights are going to be upheld or not. But finally, Mr Speaker, I want to make a point that I think is important, although some may feel it is, it is boring. But actually, do you know what? The reason that we are in this crisis now, one of the many reasons, is because we don't have a codified written constitution. It is only the unwritten, uncodified understandings that protect the body politic from regressing to government with minimal checks, balances and accountability. Up until now, we've had to depend on people playing by the rules. Well, now we have a government that is not playing by the rules. So we need more than ever a written constitution drawn up by a democratic citizens' con convention that will put people at the heart of our politics for the first time in UK history. Bob Seeley. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. The crux of the debate tonight uh, is whether we seek to buy and instruct our government in a critical period as it seeks options between the current Maduro deal, which has been rejected three times by lots of people in this House, and no deal, actually with a series of mini deals. Now, I'm sure that the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the member for Dorset West have been engaged in negotiations at a far more senior level than I. But I do find it a little bizarre that we could seek to bind our hand in our government at this point if, if the right honourable gentleman trusts those people in power, and I have to say that I do. I was engaged a little bit in some of the negotiation around with tribal Afghan leaders, and I conducted village negotiations in Badra Marshes in 2008 and 2009, Mr Speaker, and showing the limits of our negotiating power. 
showing what we were willing or not willing to do would have fatally undermined some of those conversations that happened to try to protect uh, British troops and try to stop ourselves being attacked. So therefore, binding the hands of a government as it seeks to negotiate a better deal, I think is counterproductive, although I understand his concerns. The reason this debate is so bad-tempered is because it's gone on for three years. Yeah. We yeah, have yeah, tedious yeah, cliches, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Brexit, Tory Brexit, I'm not here to stop Brexit, but it's quite clear that the Honourable Member for Vauxhall said that many people on the opposite side of the benches were using this no-deal Brexit simply as another means to stop yeah, Brexit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Beaconsfield quoted Thomas More. I've been in this House two years. I feel like quoting Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow wears on this pretty, uh, this petty pace from day to day. That's how I feel because all we talk about is Brexit. I want us to get on and talk about lots of other things. That are yeah, important. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely right. In fact, this is, it sort of feels like Groundhog Days, if you don't mind me mixing my cultural references. <laughs> pro democracy, pro EU campaigners are concerned about protecting the rights of Parliament. I find that slightly ironic for those people who want to stay in the European Union, which will do far more damage to the rights of this Parliament than this Government yes. will do ever. Absolutely. I want a deal, Mr Speaker. I want a deal. And I accept that trust in, but I accept that the most important thing here is that we have to deliver to have trust in politics. I'm also aware that neither side is perfect, that there are people now sitting on the front bench who could have voted for a deal and didn't, in the same way that there are people opposite who could have voted for a deal and didn't. But we need to deliver on a deal. And the reason why I am against this motion is it, is it provides another extension that we simply continue in a debate that becomes endless and tedious. We need to bring this to an end so we can deliver on our manifesto commitments in other areas to the British people. Thank you. Well done. Tom Brake. Mr Speaker, um, just following on the comments from the member for Brighton Pavilion, I'm sure it might be possible to provide the Leader of the House with a pillow to make him more comfortable, as he seems to be struggling during this debate. I rise to support the, uh, the Right Honourable Member for West Dorset. We have a, a simple objective, that is to block no deal and secure a resolution to the crisis and chaos the country faces. A series of government reports have set out the consequences of no, uh, of no deal, most recently, of course, Operation Yellowhammer. Medicines, fuel and food shortages, increased risks on the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and the government have been so shocked and embarrassed that they have attempted to sanitise, in fact, make this report disappear. But it is in the interests of all of our constituents, a part, of course, a part, of course, from those who are busy shorting the pound, to block no deal. We are, talk we are not talking about, as ministers do, bumps in the road. We are talking about job losses and businesses closing. The other side claim that taking no deal off the table damages our prospects of securing a deal. Now, the first problem I have with this is walking away without a deal isn't like walking into the car showroom and walking out without a car. In no deal, you're forced to leave with that banger with ball tyres and a chipped windscreen. The second problem I have with this, as set out by the Right Honourable Member for West Dorset, is no deal damages us, damages us far more than our EU friends. With no deal, the EU gets a headache, we get severe angina. The final problem is that there is no evidence the government are seeking a deal. On the EU-UK website, there are three documents listed since June that touch on this issue. There have been a couple of calls between our Prime Minister and Jean-Claude Juncker. There has, of course, been our chief negotiator, David Frost, going to Brussels. But he, what he has said is that under no circumstances would he even allow a technical extension to Article 50, which, of course, we all know would be required if, in fact, the government were to secure a deal. I've asked colleagues in the European Parliament uh, we've asked Eva Hofstadt, is there any evidence whatsoever that the government are seeking a deal? And the answer is there is total radio silence from the UK government on deal negotiations. And of course, we've had the charming Dominic Cummings 
the man who has staff escorted off the premises by armed police officers who let the cat out, cat out of the bag when he said that the negotiations are, are sham. Uh, to conclude, tonight, Mr Speaker, we must act, one, to stop a calamitous, jobs-destroying, influence-sapping, no-deal Brexit, two, to force the government to find a way out of a paralysis which is destroying our country's credibility, tearing communities apart and stopping the government dealing with the real problems we face as a nation and allow the people to express their views on its appropriateness through a people's vote. And finally, to demonstrate that the UK Parliament will resist the shutdown of our democracy and the authoritarian power grab of a rogue minority government. Andrew Bowie. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It's been quite a long time since I've had the opportunity to speak in this chamber. Well, I have spoken, as I'm sure you will attest, but mainly from a sedentary uh, position. The reason, of course, uh, being that for the vast majority of this past year, I had the privilege of f serving the former Prime Minister as her Parliamentary Private Secretary, meaning that for the majority of the past 259 days I have lived and breathed Brexit, deal, no deal, indicative votes, Cooper Letwin bowls, withdrawal agreement, the negotiations, the renegotiations, and all the attempts by the former Prime Minister, along with a group of utterly brilliant and dedicated colleagues, ministers, civil servants and special advisers to try and ensure that this country left the EU with the deal. And I did so not just because it was the job, but because I genuinely, completely and utterly believe that for my constituents, for this country, for our union, for its businesses and for our economy, it was the only rational and sensible thing to do. And I still do. But I do not support the motion being brought by, my, by the right honourable member for West Dorset this evening, and I cannot vote for it. In my opinion, we MPs, MPs from all sides of this House, if we truly want to act, and I know most of us do, in the national interest, we must support the Prime Minister and this Government in their efforts to renegotiate this deal and to leave the European Union on October the 31st. And to be able to do that, the EU must know we are serious about leaving. And that means keeping no deal on the table. If we support this motion being brought tonight, we know, the world will know, that we aren't serious at all. And where then the motivation, the impetus to get this done? And to those on the opposition benches, I'm afraid, who claim that they would do anything to stop no deal, I ask a simple question. Why didn't you? When the question was brought three times, why didn't you? And it's no good protesting that the deal wasn't good enough or that there were no guarantees or now that if only we'd known what was going to be in the withdrawal agreement bill, we would have voted for it. If you were serious, genuinely serious, about doing anything to stop no deal, you would have voted for one. So please stop pulling the wool over the eyes of the public and be honest with voters. And to those of my own benches, to my friends and colleagues for whom I have so much respect and whose support for the former Prime Minister over the last year, I am personally very grateful I say this. Please, please do not undermine this Prime Minister as so often this House of Commons undermined the last. Please give our negotiators the support they need to get the changes to this deal we need. And please do not allow to be, ta to be taken off the table the one thing that is pushing both sides towards achieving just that. I will give way. Well, Mr Speaker, I remember fondly being in the room with my honourable friend on a number of occasions. And can I just say to him, I very much look forward to his memoir on all of these subjects. Yes. <laughs> Well, I thank my uh, honourable friend for that uh, intervention and I will give him a signed copy when I get around to uh, writing them. I know that many of my friends will be voting against the government and against their party tonight. I won't give me this too, far, too, far too short time. And for many, this will be the first time they have ever done so, after decades of service loyally to this party. And I know that many have wrestled their consciences as I have wrestled mine. And I hear the arguments they make. This is not an easy decision for anybody, but I will be supporting my Prime Minister this evening. We need to get this deal renegotiated. We need to get this done. We need to leave the EU, and then we can, at long last, move this country forward. John Barron. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise in opposition to this motion and in support of my Prime Minister, essentially for two reasons. The first, Mr Speaker, is that there is a, more than a whiff of arrogance in this motion. 
Too many Remain MPs in this place will use any device to try to block Brexit. There are honourable members, Remain members, but I'm afraid there's too many who are not. And the decision was delegated by this place to the people to make their decision, and they made that decision very clearly. Now, we've been kicking this can down the road for three years, and to many outside this Westminster bubble, enough is enough. And I would remind the House that the majority of colleagues and members who are going to support the motion tonight voted in favour of triggering Article 50. And what Article 50 said very simply is that we would be leaving the EU with or without a deal. Now, we have twice extended that timeline, and that is why people outside this place are getting very frustrated with many colleagues here tonight. But apart from the arrogance, Mr Speaker, I also think this decision is ill-informed. It will make a bad deal more likely. Anyone who has negotiated in business or, or in, in, with any organisations, if the other side believe you are not prepared to walk away, it will make for a worse deal. It is a simple fact of life. Most of us in this place prefer a good trade deal to no deal. But the guaranteed way of getting a bad deal is to take no deal off the table. And for the business people in this House, and for many who have negotiated deals, they will understand that. But I also believe, Mr Speaker, it is ill-informed from an economic point of view. No deal has been derided without examining actually a lot of the economic facts. Time does not allow here now for that to be undertaken. And too many people are talking anyway, so they wouldn't hear, hear the, the points, Mr Speaker. But what I would suggest, what I would suggest is that people reflect on the fact that half people reflect on the fact that half of the EU's top ten trading partners trade on WTO no deal terms outside the EU, with parties outside the EU. It's a simple fact of life. I will give way. Mr Speaker, I, I do thank the Honourable Member for giving way, and I trust, I do sincerely hope that I am not seen to be an arrogant member of this House. I always try and represent the interests of the far north of Scotland. Will the Honourable Member and others in this chamber at least accept, accept the fact that a no-deal Brexit would ruin the crofters and sheep farmers of my constituency, and that would lead to a second high in clearances? What, what I would say in response to that is that if there, if there is a no deal, and most of us in this place want a good trade deal, there would be tens of billions of pounds to help it, those sectors of the economy and industries and sectors to readjust. That is a fact of life, but as we have done in previous economic cycles. And too many people, I suggest, not just in this place, Mr Speaker, but outside, Ignore the fact that investment and jobs is about comparative advantage. It's about how competitive your tax rates are, how flexible your labour markets are, what is your financial expertise like. We've got, this, we've got London, we've got Edinburgh. What about your R&D and top universities? In aggregate, Mr Speaker, those are more important than WTO tariffs of 3 to 5 per cent. And if proof of the pudding was required, despite all the talk in recent years about no deal is better than a bad deal, industry has been fully aware that no deal was a distinct <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Industry has been fully aware that no deal has been a distinct possibility over these last few years. What have we seen economically? We have seen record low unemployment. We have seen record manufacturing output. We have seen record investment. 
This country attracted more inward investment last year than France and Germany put together. It comes down to economic reality, and I'm afraid, Mr. Speaker, in the House, for some members coming to its decision tonight, they have not considered the economic facts. There is Rob Neal. Mr. Speaker, I've been a member of my party for 50 years. And throughout that time, I believed in our membership of the European Union. Uh, I campaigned for that in the referendum. Uh, my constituency represented to remain in the European Union, albeit by the very narrowest of, of margins. But my side lost. And I accept, therefore, that we need to leave the European Union. Yeah. Uh, and I want to leave with a deal. Yeah. Yeah. People in my constituency, businesses, those who work hard to build wealth in this country are genuinely concerned about the impacts of leaving without a deal. Their concerns are not illegitimate, they are real and they need to be addressed. But equally, they have real and genuine concerns about a prolonged uncertainty too. And I think we as politicians need to uh, weigh heavily the damage perhaps done reputationally to our body politic too. These are not easy matters. We've had a great deal of statements of uh, bold certainty in this debate and too many other things perhaps mr speaker perhaps too much hyperbole and a little less not enough pragmatism my conclusion to try and reconcile that narrow margin in my constituency and those conflicting but genuine concerns of my constituents has to be to vote three times to leave with a deal i wish others had done so as well if i believed uh, that passing this motion today would make it easier for us to achieve uh, a deal, uh, I would support it. But I do not believe that it does. Uh, I've come to the conclusion, after real heart searching, and you will know, Mr. Speaker, I have not been afraid to defy uh, the whip of my party in the past when I thought it right and proper to do so. But after real heart searching and thought, I have concluded that it would not have that effect that I wish to do, that it might have, regrettably, uh, the uh, contrary effect of reducing the government's leverage in negotiations. Because if we are to get a deal, the only point that we are realistically going to now is at the October Council, 17th, 18th of October. Uh, I don't wish to bind the hands of the government in the run-up to that. It may be a, 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 a narrowing window of opportunity to get a deal, Mr Speaker. We may not succeed, but for the sake of my constituents and to reflect that narrow margin in my constituency and also in the country and try and find a, a means of us moving on together, I believe that we should try and seize that opportunity uh, and not do anything which, whatever the motives, and I don't impugn for one second the motives or the integrity of those who have proposed uh, uh, this motion, Many of them are amongst my dearest and best friends uh, in this House. But I do believe it, it will be mistaken uh, to uh, support this motion tonight. And for that reason, I will support the Government. And I do urge my honourable friends and right honourable friends to think again before we cross a Rubicon. Fifty years many of us uh, have worked together, uh, and I hope we could continue to in the future. Uh, and I hope that they will just reflect one last time. Uh, before taking uh, the step of voting against the government tonight. Chris Bill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. For three long years we've talked, we've debated, we have voted repeatedly in this House on Brexit. And yet here we stand still, after three years, not having reached any firm resolution. In supporting the motion before the House this evening, we would simply prolong even further the uncertainty which our country is experiencing, which business is experiencing, which my honourable friend, the member for Bromley and Chislehurst, in his excellent speech a moment ago, has described. We have a responsibility, having been elected in 2017 on manifestos to respect the referendum result, to do so to stop prevaricating, to stop kicking the can down the road and one way or another reach a definitive conclusion. The motion before the House tonight does not do that. It simply prevaricates even further. Now, some members opposite have been very clear about what they want, and I respect that. My neighbour, the member for Carshalton and Wallington and the member for Brighton Pavilion, 
uh, have both been very clear uh, previously and this evening that they would rather remain in the European Union and they certainly don't want a no deal exit. That is a, uh, a view I disagree with, but at least they have clarity in expressing it. They also say they don't want to leave with no deal, but I say if you adopt that view, then you have only two choices that you either accept any deal that's offered up, no matter how bad, or you remain. And I don't think either of those options are acceptable. Remaining when the country voted to leave and we were elected the main two parties on manifestos to leave, I think is wholly unacceptable. So we have, there is only one sensible option, as the member for Bromley and Chislehurst very eloquently pointed out. Um, the question is, the question being now put, as many as other opinions say, I, of the contrary, no. No. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. The question is the motion as on the paper in the name of Sir Oliver Letwin. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. Order. The question is the motion in the name of Sir Oliver Letwin as on the order paper. As many as other opinions say aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Tell us for the ayes, Chris Elmore and Stephen Gethins. Tell us for the noes, Stuart Andrew and Ian Stewart.
Right. Uh, would the sergeant be good enough, please, to investigate the delay in the eye lobby? The eyes to the right, 328. The nose to the left, 301. Yeah. Not a good start, Thank Morris. <laughs> Order. The eyes to the right, 328. The nose to the left, 301. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. Another Burko fix. Order. Of course, point of order, the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, yeah. I think that... Thank you, Mr Speaker. Let there be, let there be no doubt. Let there be no, no doubt, Mr Speaker, about the consequences of this vote tonight. It means that Parliament is on the brink of wrecking any deal that we might be able to strike in Brussels, because tomorrow's bill would hand control of the negotiations to the EU, and that would mean more dither more delay and more confusion. And it would mean that the EU themselves would be able to decide how long to keep this country in the EU. And since I refuse to go along with that plan, we are going to have to make a choice, yes. Mr Speaker. I don't want an election. The public don't want an election. I don't believe the right honourable gentleman wants an election. But if the House votes for this bill tomorrow, the public will have to choose who goes to Brussels on October the 17th to sort this out and take this country forward. Yeah. Everybody knows that if the right honourable gentleman is the Prime Minister, he will go to Brussels and beg for an extension. He will accept, he will accept, you will accept, you will accept whatever Brussels demands, and we will have years more arguments over Brexit. And by contrast, Mr. Speaker, everyone knows that if this government is in charge and we go, if I go to Brussels, I will go for a deal, and I believe I will get a deal. And we will leave, and we will leave anyway, even if we don't, we will leave anyway on October the 31st. The people of this country will have to choose, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the opposition has been begging for an election for two years. He has crowds of supporters outside calling for an election. I don't want an election, but if MPs vote tomorrow to stop negotiations and to compel another pointless delay to Brexit, potentially for years, then that would be the only way to resolve this. And I can confirm that we are tonight tabling a motion under the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Mr Speaker, on a point of order, I welcome tonight's vote. We live in a parliamentary democracy. We, we do not have a presidency, but a prime minister. Prime ministers govern with the consent of the House of Commons, representing the people in whom the sovereignty rests. There is no consent. There is no consent in this House to leave the European Union without a deal. There is no majority for no deal in the country. As I've said before, if the Prime Minister has the confidence in his Brexit policy, when he has one he can put forward, he should put it before the people in a public vote. And so he wants to table a motion for a general election. Fine. Get the bill through first in order to prevent, in order, in order to take no deal off the table. Order. 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 
very rude for members. Order! 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 Order. I say to the Chancellor of the Duchy that when he turns up at our children's school as a parent, he's a very well-behaved fellow. He wouldn't dare behave like that in front of Colin Hall, and neither would I. Don't gesticulate. Don't rant. Spare us the theatrics. Behave yourself. Be a good boy, young man. Be a good boy. Point of order, Mr Ian Blackford. Thank you. Uh, yes, we know the theatrics that he perfected at the Oxford Union. Not interested. Not interested. Be quiet. Point of order, Mr Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, I have to say the public will be watching these deliberations tonight and what they make of the baying and the shouting that's coming from the Conservative side. Heaven only knows. This Prime Minister has a 100% record in losing votes in the House of Commons. And you would have thought that we would have had some humility tonight, but that's sadly lacking. Prime Minister, perhaps you might consider acting like a Prime Minister should do. Respect the vote. Respect the vote which has taken place in this House tonight. Let us have a bill tomorrow. This House can express its opinion that it wishes to remove no deal as an option. Don't give us this nonsense of a fantasy that there is a deal to come from the Government. It is simply not true. The Government must respect the sovereignty of the House of Parliament must allow the bill to be enacted, must allow it to have royal consent, and yes, let us have an election, but let us have an election that respects the democracy of this House and the desire that parliamentarians have to make sure that we don't crash out on a no-deal basis. Yes, point of order, Joe Swinson. On a point of order, Mr Speaker. Across the country, people have been protesting because they are worried. They are worried about the Prime Minister riding roughshod over our parliamentary democracy. And tonight, the House of Commons has spoken and said that we will not let that happen. It is vital. Much as I relish the opportunity to take on the Prime Minister in our general election, and does not tip our country into an election at a point where there is any risk that we will crash out of the European Union during that election campaign or immediately after. We must act responsibly. We point of order, Anna Subri. I'm not going to be... I'm not going to be shouted down, especially by any man. Mr Speaker, tonight's vote made even the Leader of the House sit up. (laughs) Mr Speaker, this Parliament has spoken, and we have spoken on behalf of the jobs and the livelihoods and futures of our constituents. Yet again, we have shown that we do not want a no-deal Brexit. And tomorrow, we have the opportunity to make sure that, yet again, we do not crash out without a deal. And I would remind the Prime Minister, as one of the so-called leaders of the Leave campaign, he promised the people of this country that we would not leave the European Union without a deal. I think this House now has a right to know the following. The rumour is that every single member of the Conservative Party who voted against their government tonight is going to have the whip withdrawn from them. Mr Speaker, if that's the case, that must be the first time and it would involve honourable and right honourable members who have served their party and, many would say, their country for decades. Could the Prime Minister confirm, will they have the whip withdrawn, yes or no? 
I think we need to conduct a debate on that matter across the floor of the House. It's not a matter for adjudication by the Chair, but the Right Honourable Lady has made her own point in her own way uh, with her customary force, and it's on the record, and doubtless she will wish to return to that in times to come. If there are no further points of order, the clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Census Return Particulars and Removal of Penalties Bill Committee. Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. Order. We proceed from that piece of business to motion number three on election of select committee chairs. Notice of election. The whip to move. I beg to move. Thank you. The question is as on the order paper in respect of motion number three on the election of select committee chairs. As many as are that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Order! Order! The election in Buckingham. I must inform the House that Nikki you Morgan has given me notice of her resignation as chair of the Treasury Committee. I declare the chair vacant. Nomination should be submitted by 12 noon on Tuesday, the 10th of September. Only members of the Conservative Party may be candidates in this Select Committee Chair election. The ballots will take place on Wednesday, the 11th of September, from 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Order motion number four on broadcasting the whip to move. Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. Order motion number five on exiting the European Union, brackets, air quality, close brackets, whip to move. Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. Order. We come now to the adjournment. The whip to move. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Jenny Chapman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, when I was first elected to this place in 2010, I never thought that I would find myself standing up to challenge the government about the decimation of the UK sheep industry. The ancient practice of shepherding is as old as the hills, but it's now facing an unprecedented challenge brought by the threat of a no-deal Brexit.